about a balance, off balancing. That's a term uh, in Japan known as kazushi. And kazushi provides a window of opportunity where you can affect your technique without it being blocked or disturbed. Uh, human body, we got a human um, standing right here. He, he's a biped, he's got two feet. And when he's standing on both feet, his weight is ev evenly distributed from foot to foot and his upper carriage, okay? If I push sideways, he can resist with the other leg or pull, he can resist. If he stands like a zinkus, and I push forward or backward, he can offer some resistance. Uh, as long as he can offer resistance, he can fight back or attack me and he can win. So what I want to try to do is understand the beginning at the floor level, because Kazushi's all around us, where his weak lines are and where his uh, strong lines are. Strong lines, obviously, where he can push with his toes and resist with his back leg or push with his, the sides of the muscles of his body. Weak lines are going to be uh, two points. One's called a triangulation point. The other one's called a Kazushi point. And there is a difference between the two. A triangulation point would be is that if he had a third leg growing out right here and it formed a triangle. So stand with your feet together for a second. Like this. And formed a triangle right in here. That would be the triangulation point. It would be an exact distance between his heels and a triangle point in, uh, in the middle. If I were to move Navi towards his triangulation point, he would slightly tip. However, he could still rebalance himself just by shifting his weight slightly. So I've gone into the triangulation point. Many people think this is the place where you off-balance people. Not really. It's just something that we want to be aware of for later purposes. To off-balance Navi, I have to pull him slightly to the left or right into the golden ratio of that triangulation point. That would be somewhere about right here, okay, two-thirds of the way in. So instead of the triangulation point, I want to be two-thirds of the way in. And there's a difference. Now, if he offers his hands up here, just as a demonstration, and I bring his wrist into that triangulation point and push towards it, he's going to tip. If I move it slightly over, I'm not doing anything at all except moving his hand. And he's beginning to tip forward all automatically. And this can't be resisted by anybody, um, any human being walking, unless they've got a cane in their hand. So I can push it, and I'm feeling resistance in his body. He's, he's fighting that. And I'm going to just back off that a little bit, just aim his hand over, and we have the Kazushi point. Now, the reason I want this uh, person tipped on the Kazushi point is if he is grabbing me aggressively and he's shoving my body around, I'm, I'm being controlled at this moment. So I'm thinking if I simply turn my body for later purposes into his, into his weak line, his Kazushi point, I now have an opportunity to strike, punch, or throw him, okay? If I simply go straight for a strike, throw, or punch, I can't do it. If I try to hit him, he's going to probably block it like so. If I hit him, he's going to block it, okay? However, if I get him in a triangulation point or into the weak line, it affects his balance to a degree where he's now struggling to upright himself, okay? So he has gone from a position of attack to suddenly a position of defense. And when you get that mindset of, I'm about to fall, he's not thinking about hitting me anymore. He's thinking about the ground. Okay, and even if he does try to hit me here, I'm thinking about putting him on the floor, okay, or hitting him in the jaw or knocking him out. So this is the this is the purpose and why we study Kazushi points, okay? So one of the first exercises we always do in Kazushi is just to have a person stand like in a front balance that you learn in your Taekwondo classes. And uh, just any part of the body, we're just gonna say that the arm because the arm is like a lever for the other zones of the body. Through the arm, I can connect him to the clavicle process, his hip girdle, and all of his feet. And I'm just going to try a push-pull exercise. I push into him, he resists. I pull on him, he resists. I'm going to start maneuvering this over, and he can continue to resist. But we find that little zone where he starts to tip over onto his toes. At that point, he is now, for about a second, I have a window of opportunity to strike, punch, or throw him. Okay? So... This is just an exercise we play with in the dojo just to discover where that zone exists. It, it's not something that one person can teach another. It's just something one guide can tell another through experience. But here, I'm just trying to figure out where that was. And he would trade off do the same thing to me. He would pull on me. I'd resist. Push on me. I'd resist. And he'd start to just kind of move my arm until I feel like my toes are starting to grip the ground. When my toes start to grip the ground, that's a panic moment for me, okay? If I feel like I'm tipping forward, I'm going to try to right myself. And when I start to right myself, I'm panicking because I feel like I'm about to fall down. That's the moment where you have a window to affect your waza or your technique, okay?
first Kazushi drill that we're going to work on is called uh, Katanadori, which means uh, grab your sword. Um, and um, if I have a um, partner here who's securing my wrist, I, I'm going to pretend, you know, I'm playing Google, I've got a sword on my, on my belt here, and I'm just going to reach for my sword. We'll turn this angle right over here. Um, to demonstrate the technique, I'm just drawing a sword. This is not a wrist release, this is just controlling his body so I can affect an off balance, okay? So I want to direct energy towards my pinky, my, my, my little finger, and drop my weight and step in. Now, all while I'm stepping in, you might notice that all my weight's still on my back leg and nothing's on my front leg. So I'm not moving forward or he'll push on my body. I'm dropping and stepping underneath. At the same time, I'm dropping my pinky that goes with me. And then I'm just going to make a circle like this. It's called Takubiwa, a wrist circle. I'm going to hold on to the back hand, but remember, there's no gripping involved. There's no pressing involved. I'm just dropping underneath. And I'm going to turn and draw my sword. And when I'm drawing my sword, the energy of my elbow is headed out over here towards his jaw. And then I'm going to bend my front knee, straighten out my back leg like you're doing a front stance, and then just reach for the sword right over here. At this point, I could release my hand if I want to, but I don't want to get into a second confrontation. So um, this is just an exercise to affect an off balance so that later on I can do whatever I want to do. It doesn't really matter, okay? So from here, one more time, every, you'll find that everything in, in Taekwondo is actually weapons-based later. If you learn how to use your hands adeptly and your feet adeptly, and you put a weapon in your hands, then it's just an extension of your body mechanics and your hands and feet, okay? So you're learning to punch or grab correctly, empty hand, I can have a knife in my hand to defend myself. I could be using my knife, or he might be having one too, and, and we're just, it's all weapons based. So from under here, once again, dropping the weight, dropping the pinky at the same time. This is essentially important. Never touch the forearm. Never touch the forearm. If I try to push or push on his forearm, I'm gonna meet resistance because this is not a joint. Okay, this is radius and ulna bone, and they're very, very strong, and I can't bend them, okay? So from here, all I can manipulate are the gateways. The joints, the joints, the joints. I can make those bend all day long if I turn them in a direction that's difficult for him to resist. So I'm just going to shift my body weight forward, and I'm going into that zone right behind him called the Kazushi point, and I'm going to face him in a way where he cannot hit me back. Okay, if I do this fast enough, I I can affect his knee with my, my front stance. It's affecting his knee. I'm turning it here, and if I wanted to do the throw at this point, I would, but that's a later lesson. Okay? So, from here, drop, step, turn. Everything's coming from the backside, and that's as far as this drill goes for beginners. Okay? Now, at this point, um, having seen that, grab it, come forward, and you're going to try it out on me. Okay? I'm going to grab your wrist. And when I'm grabbing your wrist, I'm not going to be squeezing your arm. So you're getting a good uh, um, aggressive stance. Good. That's much better. I'm going to be trying to control you. See what's happening here? So when I'm grabbing you, rather than just squeezing your hand, there's a control. Now see how you went backwards? That's a good thing. Now just reach for your sword. With this hand here, make a circle. Pretend you've got a sword right there. And look what's happening to my balance already. See? This can be learned right away. So here I've got you. Good. Now see how I, I found some resistance? Because this is what every beginning student, uh, you know, I know you're not a beginner, but everybody who's done this the first time is going to want to pull up on the arm. And I can push down all day long, okay? But you want to drop your pinky and then pull your weight into your back leg. Ah, see what's happening right now? I'm losing my balance, okay? So do the same thing. Dropping, turning, and look what's happening. Now if you do one more thing, it's step forward at the same time. I won't be able to compensate my weight. So if you just do your arm alone, I might be in Kazushi for just a second, but I'll be able to take a side step and resist you, okay? So drop your pinky, drop the weight. Now, now don't, don't come into me, just make a circle. Go for the sword and step. Now I'm losing my balance and beginning to fall. You see, now uh, if this was a real situation and we weren't just having a learning moment, you could have elbowed me in the face very easily, okay, or dropped me because I know you can fight, okay? So I'm grabbing here, I'm, I'm providing this, I'm being very aggressive. Immediately you would drop, drop, and uh. see how you met resistance? Do it again, drop, and bring this, like you're waving at me, waving, okay? So drop, 
wave, turn and step, and see I'm falling off balance, okay? Now, I know I'm much bigger and uh, weigh more than you, but see, how much do you weigh? 120. 120, I weigh 210, so you can off balance a much bigger, stronger opponent just by doing the right technique, okay? Now let's all pair off and try this together, okay? Good. And Abby, if you watch this too, I'll watch this too. Okay. See how you stepped over here? If I stepped into him, I'm going to have more body mass going right into his center. Try that. Step right into him as you go. See the difference? Yeah. It doesn't take strength because Taekwondo is not so much about how strong you are, but your body mechanics. It works on its own merit rather than having to be stronger than your opponent. You're never going to be stronger if it's from a giant male with a weapon. Okay. However, if you have better body mechanics, superior body movement, it's not going to matter how bigger, how much stronger they're going to be, or how armed they are, okay? Try one more time. Okay, the second Kazushi drill uh, offers another principle called the point of resistance and the point of relaxation. Uh, again, I'm going to start with a, a cross hand grab. And uh, this follows suit in everything you're going to be doing in Taekwondo. One of the first things you learn in Taekwondo is how to affect your low block and your hand that pushes backwards, okay, called, we call the hikite hand here. I'm going to use just the hikite hand or the hand that pushes backwards, okay. Uh, pushing into my body like so, the first thing I want to do is offer resistance, okay. So, th and I can't help myself. When he pushes my arm, I am automatically fighting him because I don't want to be pushed shoved backwards. Okay, from here, I'm going to do what I would normally do in Taekwondo is I turn my hand over and bring it backwards, okay. So by turning the hand over, I'm on top of his wrist. Okay, and I'm, up, I'm not going to be pulling my hand. This is important that you don't pull your hand, you push your elbow. There's a whole different set of muscles involved. If I try to pull my hand forward, he will resist and he's got bigger mass here. I'm pulling with my frontal muscles. He's got everything in his body to keep me from ha that from happening. But if I turn my wrist over and I push my elbow down, he can't do a thing to stop me. And you'll find that we experiment with this, that's very, very true. It's just a principle of physics. So I'm turning my hand over. I'm not lifting into his arm. Everybody who's ever tried this is always going to lift up into the arm. That's something you have to train yourselves out of. So just be aware that's going to happen. Instead, I'm dropping my elbow, turning over and pushing the hand backwards like this. Now I've got a Kazushi where I can affect a strike or a joint lock or whatever I need to do. So from here, if I was just going to do a simple Taekwondo punch, I've simply done a punch. Okay, see how this relates to, just relates to everything. I just did two punches. Simply punched, punched. Okay, but by using the proper body mechanics in the right zones, I can make these connections. So here I can strike, here I can push. So for the drill, Important, we make a nice circle, drop the elbow, push down with the elbow. My knuckles are right here on his uh, radius bone, and then I'm going to turn into him like so and step. So once again, here, he's pushing into me hard. I can immediately get away from that. In self-defense, I can't rely upon my body strength because I'm always going to be attacked by someone bigger, stronger. They're going to be in multiples, and they're going to be armed. So if these three people were coming at me and he came at me as well, I don't have time to box this guy or put up a boxing match with him because they're already on me. I've only got time to get around about this fast. 
and use him as a shield and maybe break his arm and hopefully live through the situation, okay? But I'd, I'd prefer to run, okay? So from here, again, I'm not getting into a, a big stance because this is close quarter, dropping, pushing the elbow down, turning the body. If I simply use the arm, that's as far as I'm gonna get. I shift my body, turn, I actually spin on the heel, point my toe where I want him to go, and just shift forward. His body will always follow where my toe is going because that's the direction my knee bends, and that's the direction. See, you cannot isolate your movements into one part of the body because all I've got is my tiny arm against his big body. It's not gonna work. Got to turn, drop my body weight. <laughs> there it goes. Turn from the hips and bend the knees forward, and then I can do whatever I want from there, okay? All right, why don't we practice that out? Everybody get a partner and come over here and work with me. Do the same thing, okay? Grab your wrist, I'll tell you for the camera, let's grab on this side over here. Now you've done this many, many times. So all you gotta do is just turn your wrist over. There you go. Now, stepping forward into your stance and push down. Good, I would step with the other leg. There you go. And step and Good, like that. See how that's directing my balance. Good. Turn the hand, make a good tight fist. Good. Other hand comes coming forward and step, punch. <laughs> and he just did Taekwondo. Isn't that crazy cool? We forget the Taekwondo. All of a sudden we're doing self-defense and we forget Taekwondo. Now go into your Taekwondo body mechanics. Just drop. Ah, see what happened? You tried to pull my arm up and when you pulled my arm up I was able to block you. Push down on the elbow. There you go. Now, <laughs> that was a knockout right there. You hit me in the zone. But when you tried to pull up, that pulled my arm up as well and I could wing block you. Okay, so here, I'm right here. I'm aggressive. I'm pushing into your body. Just drop, turn, and strike. And you've affected the Kazushi, which gave you the window of opportunity to hit me in the jaw. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Good. Zushi principle, we're going to work with a uh, kata tadori or a same hand grab. Uh, before we were a cross hand grab. Now it's a same hand grab over here. We're in an open stance, so he's, he's, he can kick, hit me, whatever he wants to do because he's got a window, okay? So what I have to do is I have to throw him into his rear triangulation point or his rear kazushi point. Uh, in order to do this, I'm simply going like this. Again, if I push into his arm and offer resistance, that's good for about one second. After that, he's going to drive me into the wall, see? So I can push, he's pushing me, I'm pushing him, and then I'm just going to let go. So as he pushes me and I offer a point of resistance here, I'm going to let go with that resistance, and I'm just simply going to drop my elbow, drop into my back leg, and turn my hand over. Now this is the part where it, it, it becomes essential, is I'm going to turn my fingers and point them just past his elbow here. And I'm going to touch this hand lightly. Then I'm going to shift into my front foot, kick my tailbone forward, and aim. Now, if you'll notice what happened when his hips, if I drop my weight, his weight drops. If I turn my hand over, that commutes to his arm as well because we have a connection. If I move from my backside, his backside is affected. So this principle is whatever I move, when we're connected together, whatever I move on my body is going to have the inverse reaction to the opponent. He's going to move the same body part but in the opposite direction. Okay? If I activate my thumb, his thumb is engaged. I just saw the blood leave his thumb right there. Okay? If I drop my hand here with my little finger, it's connected to his little finger, he feels it. If I move my hip, his hip is moved we have a connection. Now if I try to isolate my hip and there's no connection, I'm just gonna be dancing around looking like a fool. I have to have a body connection, a skeletal lock and a muscular lock with him. This is something that can only be attained through years of experience and practice. So when you're doing these exercises, um, my advice is don't do them one or two or three times and then move on to the next thing, but practice them diligently. If you read any books like uh, Gorin No Show or the Book of Five Rings by Musashi, he ends that by saying, you must practice this many, many, many. So from here, turning, pointing the fingers just past the elbow, dropping the weight, moving my backside, and I have a kazushi. Okay? Now the cool thing about all these kazushis, I know we're doing wrist grabs and people say, why do you always grabbing the wrist? So I can establish a lever to his center. He might decide to grab my shoulder. I can still do it. Okay? And I did that kind of fast, but I still did the same thing. I pushed against him, I let go. 
I dropped my weight into my back leg. I'm going to do this very big, and then I'm just going to kick my energy, since I have a connection to his arm, underneath his arm as though I were punching. But I'm going to punch from here. So I wouldn't, in Taekwondo, punch with just my shoulders. I would punch with my entire body. See? So anytime you're doing any technique in your Taekwondo, it's not arms, it's center. Here, center has to be affected. He can grab, again, with both hands. And I can still do it as long as my center is affected. If I simply push on him, nothing's going to happen. If I try to punch, I'm not going to, nothing's going to happen. He's, he, he's blocking me all he wants to. However, I can move my center and I can get him off of me just for a second and then come in with a, a flurry of other techniques, okay? So once, one more time, grabbing my wrist, we're doing this just as a beginning drill in Taekwondo to learn how to affect control over another person's frame. Dropping, turning, again, see the importance of the little finger, it connects to his little finger and that's what has this commutive technique to turn his hand over. Just spinning my hand does nothing. I have to connect to his entire arm and bring it around like a spool. He's already beginning to affect. That's the pre kazushi I'm touching here so he, he thinks he can't let go. And then push like that, okay? The words that say, thinks you can't let go, this is an illusion. <laughs> In his mind, when he feels this, he doesn't feel like he can turn loose. Can you? Of course he can. If I were to step against his back foot, he would think his foot was trapped. But he can move it all he wants to. Sometimes we'll do a technique where I'll step on a person's foot and they think that they can't move their foot. For that one split second, they won't move their foot because their mind is tricked. It's an illusion. Everything we do in our martial art is like a magician's act. It's an illusion. They don't see the surprise or the prestige happening because we're doing something really big right here. So if he's punching my face, I do something really big, he'll follow that movement like this. That's a kazushi right there. And we'll hear, um, that's a kazushi. This, he doesn't know. That was a kazushi. He sees this happening and he might fight it. That's hiding what's about to happen right over here. Okay? That's, that's the magician waving the magic wand and here's the little trap door he didn't see. Right over here. See how that works? Now, we'll work together in group. Try that and then, Brianna, you're going to do it to me now. Okay? I'm going to grab your wrist. Okay? Same thing as before. First thing you do is just enter with your, your front foot, but put no weight on it and step right inside my leg. There you go. Now see how your arm drifted backwards? At the same time, keep your arm coming forward. Don't collapse your elbow. Good. And turn this over. And you're going to point that direction and touch. Good. Now from here, bend your front knee. Good. Now see how you're, you just leaned into me? You're going to take all the energy from your spine and shove it forward. <laughs> and you see how everything ended up being spinal? It's your lower tailbone that's affecting all mine, okay? So from here, turn, turn, point, step. Now to help you point, turn your body. There you go. I'm already starting to go, okay? I can't stand up to that. So here I've got my, 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 my aggressive stance. Step in, good. Now the reason you're stepping inside here, a little bit further. Good, now step in the outside of my leg and see what happens. I can resist you with my arm, see? Step inside my leg. There I begin to go. So sometimes the secret is the ashi sabaki or the footwork. So if you step outside, do it one more time. Step outside. See how I can fight you with my arm? Mm -hmm. Now simply step inside between the, my, my feet. I'm already starting to go. See how that works? Sure. Now I might be able to do it to the outside of somebody's legs because I've had a lot of experience, but turn your hand over. Now as you're doing this, enter. Because I bet when you do your forms, you wouldn't do this. You would make you come forward, okay? So do your forms, come forward like you're doing a kata. Wow, that was beautiful. See, so just forget about me for a second and do the kata. I don't exist. <laughs> Much better. That was a lot of energy, but you see you still, even with a lot of energy, you still were able to throw me backwards. See how that works? Sure. Try it again. Here, uh, you got all panicky. And just think about this, I'm stronger, I'm bigger, so you gotta, you gotta relax and not panic, okay? Let's uh, talk a little bit about the uh, bone structure of the hand, wrist, fingers. Uh, every bone in your body is connected through fiber to another bone in the body, and I don't want to get into an anatomy lesson, 
but was, since we're talking about the hand and the wrist today, I'm just isolated there. Uh, looking at the back of the hand now, you've got your phalanges, your uh, major uh, metatarsals and your meta metacarpals and your carpal bones you through here. Uh, when we're doing uh, techniques known as uh, tequaza or hand techniques or uh, wrist locks, we have to really understand the anatomy of the, of the wrist and all the carpal bones. The two bones that probably are most important are the scaphoid bone, which is about right in here, and the pisiform bone, which is right out here at the very, very end. When you get into your trapezius and trapezium bones are in the middle. Those are secondary for like when you're trying to move the wrist this way and that way. To do some of the more common locks, we want to talk about the allergies, okay? Any point up here, you can see that the palm is like a big square flat area. And if I go from one radius to the other, across this way, that's known as an allergy. If I go from here to here, that's going to be a beneficial area for healing. So from here to here is an allergy, from here to here is an allergy. For example, kodagaeshi, uh, or forearm coiling, starts here, moves to an allergy, and then goes to the other side where the elbow is. So if I bring that in, it's causing, right here, this bone to have an allergy to that side where the scaphoid bone I just talked about is, I put it under pressure. Now it's pinching in and it creates a little bit of discomfort. If I continue to twist, nothing's going to happen. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing down, I'm bringing this out and causing the elbow to shoot across the hip like so, okay? So all of these are interconnected. Same thing, if I'm doing a sankyo, and I'm going to bring the fifth um, carpal, metacarpal bone over here into the scaphoid again and drop my elbow, I'm going to have a lot of pain right there. It's going to create a whole lot of pain right in here, which is a reverse sankyo, okay? Do a normal sankyo, come out over here, I'm doing the same thing, right here, same zone. That very last uh, metacarpal bone over here to the scaphoid once again, and I'm going to just lock his fingers in like so. And if I put pressure here and directly bring it across there, it makes this little zigzag just like this in layman's perm. So going up to the humerus bone, which goes up here, here into the rotator cuff, which hits the glenoid cavity and causes a lock. Well, I heard a pop. It causes a little bit of a lock right there which in turn we can continue to do things with, okay? But this is just being a temporary lock up there like this, okay? So anytime we're talking about the joint locks or hand manipulations or jujitsu, it's really important that you pick up a book called Gray's Anatomy. And uh, my teacher said it was like his Bible. It wasn't like it was a religious thing, it's just he studied it intensely, okay? Look at the pictures first to get an idea of how the map of the human body works and then actually read the text. Read the text, it will tell you things about how these bones and muscles and nervous systems articulate with one another, okay? Also, as a martial artist, you can see which part of the hand, the body, and the wrist, and the bones are weakest and at what point. An example might be the radius bone. Weakest part of the radius bone is right here, two-thirds of the way from the elbow to the wrist. This is where, in the karate, a lot of times, we would strike, and I could break that bone if I really wanted to break his arm. If I tried to break it here, it would be a no-go. Too much muscle tissue, too much near the end. If you wanted to break a board, you wouldn't hit it on the very end. And you sometimes, even in the middle, is not a great point. Sometimes it's just about two-thirds of the way through, the board's at its weakest part. And that's where I'm going to strike it and break it and be easier for me. Same thing right here. Gray's Anatomy will teach you. They say the, the injuries that most commonly occur in Gray's Anatomy are here, 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 and at those places. And if you read those texts and you're a martial artist, you can find out if I'm going to defend my life and I have to hit, punch, or twist somebody, here are the most effective places to do that. So again, pick up Grace Anatomy, study it, and then find a teacher who can teach that to you very, very well. Throwing a, a standard punch. And Mr. Hooks has done this five swords block He's striking the bicep and also not just blocking the hand but controlling the arm like a lever. But what's wonderful about this is the humerus bone is being affected, which affects the entire back over here. All he has to do is a circular forward bone. Okay, we're going to focus on a, a wrist locking technique, which is more of a body locking technique called Tehana. Tehana translates to flower hand. And in the, the Tai Chi forms, the old Chinese forms, it's like gathering flowers 
and bringing them up, okay? Um, I'm going to do this in a very classical sense over here, just to show you what the technique might look like. I'm not going to do it really, really fast, but it's in here. And we'll lock his body up so that if he doesn't take that fall, he's going to suffer a broken arm, okay? Now I'm going to move over here a little bit closer so you can see the technique. Uh, from a wrist grab, uh, I have a knife in my hand, and I'm defending myself, and he doesn't want to get stabbed. There's going to be an altercation. He might want to try to hit me with the other hand. So what I'm going to do is like the gathering of the flowers. And to make this more apparent, let's just do it. Maybe you can see from here if it's a real Tedori two-handed wrist grab. Like I'm gathering flowers, this turns his hands and his body and his arms upward. And I'm going to present the back of the hand right here where the fifth uh, metacarpal bone is. Put my thumb there and grab the meat of the thumb in here like so. Now from here, I'm going to roll my hand around so it's like an MC Escher drawing, like this. And continue to pan the palm of my hand to where it covers the back of all of his bones in through here, like this. So I've rolled this up and coming around like so. From there, I'm just going to lightly grab and let my arms simply relax. If you try to force this, the pressure will cause resistance from you, okay, he will fight back. If I'm just giving him nothing but lightness, he doesn't feel anything to push against and he can't fight back as easily. From here, I'm gonna do like a sword cut. I'm gonna pretend I have a sword, I'm gonna cut and cut, like two kasagiri here, okay? So here, I'm going to just, using my hips, after I've dropped, I felt the tension come out, I'm gonna move across the body, then I'm gonna try to cut right across his leg here, and then down he goes, okay? So this is the way you'd want to practice it in the very, very beginning. Instead of doing this big dynamic throw, which could injure you, your, your uh, uke, you don't want to do that. Practice here, relax, 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 there. He's at the end of his rope right there. Then I'm simply going to turn my body. Notice my hands have done nothing, they're done. Then I'm going to turn my body, but I'm going to turn it at a downward angle. So instead of turning back where I was, I'm going to try to pretend like his hand is the handle of a sword and I'm using, this is the blade of the sword to cut his leg, right there, right across the leg like so. So I'm doing two sword cuts, and it's not like this. Turn the entire body as a unit, okay? Once again, to make this hand turn over, if I simply try to turn from the hand, there's no way in the world I can make him move. I have to move his entire body. To do that, I have to capture the pinky. To do that, I have to gather flowers. Okay, and because he has such a tenacious hold on my wrist, it's going to work for me. So he does not want to let go of my wrist. If he lets go of my wrist, I'll stab him. Okay, so he doesn't want to let go. So there's a lot of tension, and I'm using that tension. So I'm gathering the flowers down here. My pinky is the most important part of the direction, which leads to my elbow. If you notice, the hips rotate as well here. Then I rotate the hips again. Great. Take a hold of the hand here, but I'm not grabbing it tightly. When I bring my elbow down, it releases his fingers, and I grab a hold here. All my weight, by the way, is on my back leg. Okay, so I'm going to shift my weight to the middle between both legs and make that first cut. Second cut, right through the femur bone, and he has to lay down and lose his arm. From there, you can do whatever submission holds that you're taught to do. One more time, Tejana, from a one-handed position, Okay, from Rio Tedori, two-handed positions here. Got both of my hands here. Gathering the flowers, crossing the hands. Again, crossing the hands. You do this in some of your kamai, okay? Crossing the hands. Turn. It always works. One last time, very slowly. He's pushing into my body. He's trying to push me backwards. I'm trying to struggle with him. I'm going to go around that struggle. Instead of through him, I backed up. I went around the struggle. I'm lifting up his pinky, turning, letting this go. I find he's at the end of his rope. I'm on my back leg only. Shift my body to the middle while I'm making a cut across the midsection. Then I'm going to cut across the femur bone, down. And that is the introductory method of Tejana. There is also intermediate and advanced methods to do this. We can cover probably a little bit later. Okay. Okay, 
Master hooks are going to uh, do a combination of joint uh, and body lock technique called a combination of Sankyo and Katatao Sai, which means third technique and also uh, same hand uh, press. So um, I'm going to take over and do the slow motion. This is attack Munidori. He's doing a fan block, elbow Timmy, uh, underarm reversal. He's capturing the humerus bone and the ulna. This is the Katatao Sai right in through here. What I like what Mr. Hooks does is he does a, a slight circle with the entire palm of the hand in a reverse fashion, which causes an enormous amount of pain, and he has control. From here, he can transfer to any kind of a submission hold he wants. He's using Ikkyo and going straight to the floor, Ikkyo, and kneeling on the arm right up above the ulna where it becomes the humerus, which is, again, very painful right up above this joint right up in here. If you press on that with a lot of, especially if Mr. Hooks' his knee right in here, uh, you're going to want to scream out loudly because I felt that before and it really hurts. Okay, get in slow motion. Grab. Timmy. Very effective. One thing I like about what, what Mr. Hooks is doing is the use of the Timmy. Can you show that Timmy one more time to strike? As he's coming here, he strikes. Now, this is important uh, in martial arts. If Mr. Hooks didn't do the Atemi, that means hand was ready to fire. Because he hit here, that's a distraction to his mind. It brings his mind to another part of his body, which allows Mr. Hooks to go under the arm at the next point. If he had tried simply to go under the arm, that means might have grabbed him in a chokehold. But because he was struck here, his movement was, was halted. Okay, It struck him and made his mind go there, plus it was painful, and it made this arm completely inactive because his mind isn't on his arm right now. And from there, now he's got the capture, he's got the submission, he can go into where he wants. You notice when he moves Naveed forward, rather than straight to the ground, he's walking him forward. That keeps Naveed from squatting and standing back in and over-rotating to stand back up again. So the forward motion, when you've got room clearance for that, is, is the wisest choice. Feel the compression on your feet? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he bounced. <laughs> Look at that compression. <laughs> uh, wrist locking technique, which is more of a body locking technique called Tehana. Tehana translates to flower hand. And in the, the Tai Chi forms, the old Chinese forms, it's like gathering flowers and bringing them up, okay? Um, I'm going to do this in a very classical sense over here, just to show you what the technique might look like. I'm not going to do it really, really fast, but it's in here. And will lock his body up so that if he doesn't take that fall, he's going to suffer a broken arm. Okay, now I'm going to move over here a little bit closer so you can see the technique. Uh, from a wrist grab, uh, I have a knife in my hand, I'm defending myself, and he doesn't want to get stabbed. There's going to be an altercation. He might want to try to hit me with the hand. So what I'm going to do is like the gathering of the flowers. And to make this more apparent, let's just do it. Maybe you can see from here, if it's a real Tedori two-handed wrist grab. Like I'm gathering flowers, this turns his hands and his body and his arms upward. And I'm going to present the back of the hand right here where the fifth uh, metacarpal bone is. Put my thumb there and grab the meat of the thumb in here like so. Now from here, I'm going to roll my hand around to it's like an MC Escher drawing, like this. And continue to pan the palm of my hand to where it covers the back of all of his bones in through here, like this. So I've rolled this up and coming around like so. From there, I'm just going to lightly grab and let my arms simply relax. If you try to force this, the pressure will cause resistance from your uke, and he will fight back. If I'm just giving him nothing but lightness, he doesn't feel anything to push against, and he can't fight back as easily. From here, I'm going to do like a sword cut. I'm going to pretend I have a sword. I'm going to cut and cut, like two kesagiri here. Okay? So here, I'm going to just, using my hips, after I've dropped, I've felt the tension come out. I'm going to move across the body. And then I'm going to try to cut right across his leg here. And then down he goes. Okay? So this is the way you'd want to practice it in the very, very beginning. Instead of doing this big dynamic throw, which could injure you, your, your uh, uke, you don't want to do that. Practice here. Relax, relax, relax. There, he's at the end of his rope right there. Then I'm simply going to turn my body. Notice my hands have done nothing. They're done. Then I'm going to turn my body, but I'm going to turn it at a downward angle. So instead of turning back where I was, I'm going to try to pretend like his hand is the handle of a sword. And I'm using, this is the blade of the sword to cut his leg. Right there. 
right across the leg like so. So I'm doing two sword cuts, and it's not like this. Turn the entire body as a unit, okay? Once again, to make this hand turn over, if I simply try to turn from the hand, there's no way in the world I can make him move. I have to move his entire body. To do that, I have to capture the pinky. To do that, I have to gather flowers, okay? And because he has such a tenacious hold on my wrist, it's gonna work for me. So he does not want to let go of my wrist. If he lets go of my wrist, I'll stab him. Okay, so he doesn't want to let go, so there's a lot of tension, and I'm using that tension. So I'm gathering the flowers down here. My pinky is the most important part of the direction, which leads to my elbow. If you notice, the hips rotate as well here. Then I rotate the hips again, grab, take a hold of the hand here, but I'm not grabbing it tightly. When I bring my elbow down, it releases his fingers, and I grab a hold here. All my weight, by the way, is on my back leg. Okay, so I'm gonna shift my weight to the middle between both legs and make that first cut. Second cut, right through the femur bone, and he has to lay down and lose his arm. From there, you can do whatever submission holds uh, you're taught to do. One more time, Tejana, from a one-handed position. Okay, from Rio Tadori, two-handed positions here. Got both of my hands here. Gathering the flowers, crossing the hands. Again, crossing the hands. You do this in some of your kamai, okay? Crossing the hands. Turn. technique, Tejana, it always works. One last time, very slowly. He's pushing into my body. He's trying to push me backwards. I'm trying to struggle with him. I'm going to go around that struggle. Instead of through him, I backed up. I went around the struggle. I'm lifting up his pinky, turning, letting this go. I find he's at the end of his rope. I'm on my back leg only. Shift my body to the middle while I'm making a cut across the midsection. Then I'm going to cut across the femur bone down. Right. And that is the introductory method of Tejana. There is also intermediate and advanced methods to do this. We can cover probably a little bit later. Okay, okay. Uh, let's talk about the um, assembly and uh, of the forearm as it becomes the elbow and the upper arm area. Okay, the bones of the forearm are the radius and ulna. And the radius is going to be the shorter of the two bones. The ulna is the longer bone. The ulna begins right here at the very, very back, and it's connected uh, to the trapezium bone right up here in your in uh, the carpal area. Okay. Uh, there's a really big knotty area at the end of it, as though it was like a staff with a big kind of a, a, a terminal head right in through here. It goes all the way up and then becomes the elbow. So the elbow you're looking at isn't really like a complicated joint. It's the end of a bone. Okay, that's why it's so effective in elbow strikes, because it's like taking a pole and striking something with the end of a pole. That's your elbow. It's strongest about right in here. The point of it is at its weakest. If you try to hit something with the point of your elbow, you're likely to chip and shatter that part of your elbow. If you're striking right about in through here, it's like using the knife of your hand rather than the tips of your fingers, if that makes any sense, okay? So the ulna bone is the strongest bone of the forearm and literally impossible to break. If you're breaking the ulna, that was a tremendous amount of force. The radius, on the other hand, is the smaller of the two bones. It's kind of interconnected in between and links over. One of the bones crosses around over here, and the radius just kind of just sits in between. It's a very small bone, and it's, a, it's the bone that's shattered mo most often when there's arm injuries. And it goes from right here where the thumb is connected right to the scaphoid bone, comes up here, and then ends up just short of where uh, the elbow joint is. Both of these joints kind of come around here and terminate right about there, right about here where my hands are touching, at the humerus bone. The humerus bone, in martial arts, from the waist up, the humerus bone is the most important bone you want to be concerned with. Most people don't even think about that. They think about, I want to punch you in the solar plexus or hit you in the jaw. <laughs> to control someone's entire body, this is the bone you want to control it with. This is my steering wheel. Uh, so because you have a thing called an elbow, if I block Navid's arm, I can run into that elbow and get killed, okay? If I block his humerus, I can move his entire body. 
If he tries to strike back with it and he runs into my heel, it does him in. So to control his body, this humerus bone is kind of what I want to move around a lot, okay? Now, another uh, remarkable thing about the radius and ulna bones is if you're standing uh, like an anatomy uh, skeleton, they look like they're in a straight line. But when you radiate or turn your hand over and you make a fist, they cross each other like this. This is an important thing to know. It's like winding rope. If you had two strands of rope and you start to wind them, they become shorter, okay? Also, get it tighter, there's less flexibility. So whenever I'm doing anything to wind those two bones together, the arm becomes shorter here, it becomes fle less flexible, and he runs out of room and has to get on the tips of his toes. Or uh, in another demonstration, Mr. Hooks uh, had his arm compressed here, and when he really put that on him, Navid's jumped up off the ground because the compression was so great, okay? It really shortened his rope, and he had no place to go but air to escape the pain, okay? So when you see someone moving or squirming, it's because they're trying to get out of the way of the pain. Plus, you've shortened their anatomy somewhat to where they really have no place else to go but find open air to move in. And we as martial artists are taking advantage of that open air, okay? One more thing about the radius and ulna bones is that they're right in here, radius and ulna and humerus are very flexible and we can move them like water because we're human beings we move like water. As a martial artist, I can take advantage of the idea that all of this is not stiff but in motion, okay? For example, if he's reaching for me here, a simple block sends his entire body out of the way, okay? If it was stiff as, a, as, as, as a, here, it wouldn't work as well. Because he's reaching for me here, I can just slap it and move him over and I can suddenly be behind him. And that gives me a yin-yang. He's turning and I'm turning. So I can start from here and end up over here in his mind almost magically. He can end up very, very quickly to the other side simply because I'm taking advantage of lengthening this arm rather than trying to block it. Or now I'm going to run into a lot of compression and a lot of resistance. I'm taking advantage of the anatomy of these two bones. And look, the first metacarpal bone is a handle that was given to me to do this with or do this with. So when he's, he's punching at me, I know his hand is bigger and I can use this little handle to lengthen his arms and get him on his toes to do a technique to get behind him, okay? Like so. So again, knowledge of the arm and how it works, if you study this and understand the articulations and how everything moves and folds and works, you're no longer just slapping at areas of the body and hoping something will land in your favor. You have absolute knowledge of how this is gonna work for you, like you know a light's gonna come on and you turn on the switch, rather than throwing a stone at it to hope you get illumination, okay? So knowledge is power. Take advantage of the knowledge we have in the world. Okay. Hey, Dory, or a lapel grab. When your is doing a lapel grab, he's not grabbing my clothes, he's using my clothes to push me around, okay, like this. If he's trying to push me in this direction, I'm just gonna give that to him by turning my other shoulder right in his direction and giving him as a punch, because in karate, we like to do this a whole lot. This is just a natural motion for me to learn. So as he's pushing me, I'm gonna strike him here, and I'm gonna continue around the back, right at the crook of the elbow here, and in this case, I'm gonna use my little finger, and my other hand also wants to punch, so he could either punch him or just come around over here like I'm punching over around his, his head like so. Good. I'm using my belly to lift up his elbow. If you feel like you don't have a big enough belly, you can use your arm. These techniques you do in karate. Here. One and two. Now, I'm simply going to step together and turn and then just do a nice polite bow. And on the bow, that brought his tailbone past his heels and you were struggling just to stand. We reverse and see the other side so you see what's going on here. He's pushing me. I'm going to give in, but I'm going to hit him. Come in here and just instead of pulling, I'm dropping my elbow. Here, dropping my elbow, coming across over here, I'm using my, my knees and my gut to lift up his elbow, and then I'm just going to step and turn. You see how that's bringing him way off? He's struggling just to stand. So if you just bow, he gets to fall down. That's the nice way to do it. If you didn't want to be nice, strike him on the way down and that's if this guy's more dangerous you don't want to let him fall and get back up and hit you okay now I'm going to transfer that to Brianna over here now that you have a chance to observe that 
uh, you can show mastery of it, right? Or just right, just like that. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, he's grabbing. He grabs. First thing you do is you're going to feel pressure. So you're going to give with it and strike. Good. Follow through. Grab here. Striking with the other hand. Boom. And then wrap around over here. Grab it by the neck. And it rotates your entire body to pull his head up. Turn. Slightly step offline. There and bow. And the minute you bow, it's like he magically falls because you can feel you were holding him up. You know, and since you were holding him up, all you have to do is let him go. Try that again one more time. Good. Nice. Nice strike to the, to the jawbone. Yes. There, turn and step. And then don't forget, when you're turning, go ahead and step like this. When you're doing Tai Chi patterns, sometimes they actually step over and that's the reason why. Okay, one more time. For fluency. Two. Strike. Good. Step and bow. Good. And one thing I'd add is when you step, plant your heel. So step over, plant your heel, and sit and bow. Because every time, what you're doing is you're moving in a declining step pattern. So you kind of go down, cross, down, down, cross, down, down, cross, down, down, cross, down. So he's always going towards the earth, and he's never walking away from you. One more time, and all that went up. Good. Strike. Right? Good. Now, downward. Yes. Downward. Downward. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you felt that? Did you hear him groan? That, that was not an accident. Very good. Thank you very much. So, in uh, fast motion, happens something about like that. Good. Come on a little bit more. Good. Anytime you move fast, some of your technique's going to fall off, and that's expected. You want to be doing that. This is my first thing I can do. I can continue to do more tempo. If I need to, the more trained you are, the more you can uh, uh, not say make up, but you can add to it. It's, it's creative, okay? Sometimes I can just, maybe I don't do my jujitsu. This will hurt a whole lot more. It's already tapping out, okay? But hanario, this hanario, which means twisting, is done from here. This is just a crutch. He grabs me. This is where it's coming from, rather than this. I'm off balance now. If I grab his arm, <laughs> He's got resistance, he can push me away. So I'm compressing into him by making my body, here's my pivot point, but I'm free to move here. So as I move here, we're talking about those two bones of the forearm, we're gonna push that elbow right into his belt. <clears throat> See, I don't really need my hand. I really don't need my hand. It's all done from the waist, like so, okay? So as you get more, uh, more adept in the technique, talk about another elbow technique in this series uh, called Ude Katame. Ude means the back side of something or the reverse side of something. Katame is a submission or a pin. Uh, sometimes a katame can be like an atoshi or a drop. Uh, we'll start classically just from a connection to the wrist. This isn't how I normally would do it. We'll do that in a minute. And I'm, without having to describe this, I'm just going to lead the arm out and rotate to get to the back side of the arm. This is the ura. This is the omote the front and the ora, the back, okay? I really wanna be right here where the humerus connects to the, um, um, the um, ulna bone and creates the elbow. Right on the very back of that elbow, that's real important to me, okay? So it's coming in through over here, striking. I'm gonna place my armpit right at that joint and then just kind of cross my arms a little bit. I'm gonna load my standing leg and kick out my other leg and just lean into it a little bit like so. If I do this correctly, I would go ahead and sit down. And I would be sitting down before he has a chance to fall and the arm would snap backwards, okay? So from the load, I'm lengthening the arm, rotating, right in through here because he has a hold of me, striking if I need to, just crossing and holding on right over here, just hold on to my arm and just lean. Don't want to jump on him because I've had my elbow broken this way accidentally. Thing, if you get more advanced, it sometimes helps to slightly rotate backwards. Now he's on his heels. And it comes on a little bit faster. So to make it come on faster, all I rather have to do is rotate back and squeeze. So I'm just squeezing like you do with these techniques and squeeze in. Against a punch, this is against a punch. I want to do the attempt. If I get my arm here, like in these techniques, as long as my hand is here and he continues to punch, he's missing me. I don't have to continue to do all that business here. So I'm just simply going to strike it. Now I'm already into the technique and I can do the arm break just in case I don't want to do anything else or there's multiples. Strike. 
rotate. Do it in time. Okay? Hey! That worked. Real important not to do this. <laughs> but. Yeah, I want to demonstrate a technique Grandmaster Milton showed us today, uh, which I think is highly effective and it beautifully illustrates the gateways that we're trying to accomplish here using your Taekwondo techniques. Taekwondo, um, like you're doing, call it outer ear, a block, your hand would come up and you would block. There's techniques that come in through here, there's techniques that do this in your Taekwondo curriculum, okay? So I'm uh, fighting this person here and this turned into a stand-up battle and he may be up like a boxer and he wants to throw that jab, okay? Jabs are really hard to get around because even if I try to cover for them, I'm going to eat that other hand, okay? If I'm using my front hand to block here, I could run into an elbow. So I'm going to do the type one bill. You pick that hand up. Why would you pick that hand up? Here. Why would you pull it back? Here. Pulling it back. Here. So if I'm bringing it here, bringing it down, I'm going to snap the elbow. This is upwards here. While I've got him down here, I'm literally just going to jump up, hammer fist the, sh the shoulder joint here. Step up slightly, using my heel, kick up the leg, hey! and finish technique, okay? So, from here, I'm reaching, striking, striking, kicking, hey! and finish, okay? So, once again, not this. This is okay, but it just delays the inevitable. If I'm fighting here, and I block his hand, he's going to run me down. I want to enter with something where I'm still standing my ground, but I move forward. And that's why in your kata, they'll tell you, bring that hand up, step and punch. Here, bring that hand up, step and block. You're not bringing that hand up just so you pull it back again. You bring that hand up because it's a technique. Now, I, got, I like being on this side of his body because his hands are on the other side. From here, what I like about what Mr. Milton did was he broke the elbow joint. Now I have to worry about that arm at all. But sometimes you can miss because when you're moving fast, missed it. So there's my backup right there. And when I do this, you don't do this. <laughs> you bring the other hand up. My other hand went down here, so I'm bringing it up here. Then I can kick, hold on to the hand. Break the ribs, because that will do it. And then get the heck out of the way. Okay? So, Mr. Milton's technique. Hey! Hey! Okay? Now a little bit quicker. One more time, slow motion. Here. This comes down to my hips. Breaking. Let's talk about uh, the anatomy and range of motion of the shoulder. Okay, I got Navi's back to you. So you talk about this area in here which encompasses the shoulder. The shoulder is a very complicated uh, joint. Uh, so I don't have a lot of time to talk about it in depth. Let's just talk about it on a big global sense. Um, before I talk about the shoulder, let's talk about the um, scapula, which is also called the shoulder blade, which is this huge bone shaped almost like a big wedge in, the, in his back. And you can articulate that scapula, like you can make it pop out, you can move it around, you can make circles. It's a very mobile bone, but it moves kind of like a big plate in your back. It can come out this direction, it can go up and down. So understanding the range of motion the scapula has and how it controls the back where the, uh, the vertebra and the ribs are connected to each other is an important thing in martial arts, okay? Uh, next that we have the clavicle process called the collarbone and the trapezius muscle. All these are connected and they make a unit, okay? So the clavicle process is connected here and terminates right about here where the radius bone comes into the, um, uh, the um, rotator cuff. Now, to rotate your arm, if you're standing straight and you can't turn your body, how far back can you bring your arm? That's about it. That's the range, and he's a young man. This is the range of motion that your arm has. Many people think you can just move your arm around in a big circle. To do that, Navi would have to turn his body now he can bring it around and turn it back around like so. That's also very important to know that I, I thought, well, if I had to bring his arm way back and he's rotating his, 
his body, he can hit me. If I can keep his body from rotating, I can control him because that's the range of motion. If you don't know these things, you're just messing around with the arm and hoping something will work. Okay, turning around the other direction here. Let's talk about lateral motion. How far up can you, that's about as far as it'll go. He can't bring it around behind his head unless he what? Rotates his body, now he can do it. So you see that body rotation, hip rotation, is important in karate to extend your punches and your power. It's also important to know that if you're trying to control somebody else's body, know the limits of their ability to rotate their body. Can't bring any further here. This is about the extent of it there until you turn your body and come back around again. Okay, so the most common injuries in martial arts are the shoulders, that's the number one injury, and the knees, that's the number two injuries. More than that, it's just gonna be wherever you happen to get struck and hit. But just by wear and tear alone, we do a lot of this. And if you do this incorrectly without shoulder or hips rotations, this is the first thing that comes out in martial arts, usually because of bad punching or hitting too forcefully with your arms without using your body as a unit. Knees, all the stomping you do for 30 years starts to affect your knees. Roundhouse kicks without, just by locking your knee out, destroys your knees. So your most common problem is gonna be shoulder because we use these an awful lot. You throw a ridge hand and you throw it wild and somebody blocks you, your shoulder's gonna come out of socket, okay? Because of your range of motion, you're still turning your body and your arm got stopped your body comes out and your shoulder does not, okay? So these are very important things to know as far as radial motion. Again, get on Google, look up how the shoulder, uh, the socket, uh, the ball and socket joint works here in the shoulder cuff, and you'll see there's a whole lot, of complicated system of, of tendons and um, nerve endings and um, meniscus in here that literally can come loose and be injured. Uh, many people watching this today might say, yeah, I've got one already. Okay, go back and review what was the cause of those shoulders. You're going to find out it's usually over rotating or sometimes being manipulated by somebody and before you have a chance to tap out or maybe it's happened to me, uh, suddenly it goes and then, then you tap. Or you feel like, well, that doesn't hurt and the guy goes a little bit further and then suddenly something comes out. So you can only bend so far. It's important to have that knowledge to know how far you can bend and how far you can bend somebody else in order to control them and to keep yourself from being injured in martial arts. About okay. uh, a common technique they used in almost every martial art called shihonage, uh, which means four method uh, throw. Um, the technique I'm gonna use is the introductory method. Uh, you learn the introductory method first, get a handle on that and move to other methods that actually work. Uh, this method has to be studied before you can get into the ones that actually are combat effective. So we're going to do the Jim Carrey comic sketch approach that uh, Navi is attacking people over the head with a knife. Now, although that seems comical, people do that sometimes. They actually will. One of our instructors got attacked by a shard of glass exactly this way. And he used this technique. So first thing I'm going to do is just my ageute, my, my rising block. Now, the thing I don't want to do is what I just did. I don't want to wait until Naveen has the knife on me to decide to block it sticking in my head. I'm going to wait until, let's sit back here, when he raises his hand up, I'm going to move in. Okay? So right about now, my hand, the other hand is down. Okay? So if you do a kata, sometimes our kata will raise the hand up and then we'll step and block. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're doing our kata. We're raising the hand up first. Then I'm going to bring this other hand up through here and join my other wrist. This is sometimes called a four-corner throw because it looks like well, square right in through here. Uh, it's a four method throw in through like so. Now, right in here, here's here's a little Jim Mr. Melton turned us all on to. Is if I point his hand towards his spine, can you do this aerial combo? Yep. It hurts more. Yep. Okay. And he has to, that's the only way he can get out to save his rotator cuff. I'm not gonna do that because I'm gonna mm -hmm. not break my uke. Okay, so coming through here. To throw him, I do not need to, and I highly discourage, I want to make this very clear, if you're watching this tape, to not throw your hands down. Do that to the bad guy. To your friend, shift your body weight forward and bend your knees, and then just drop your arms. He'll still fall to the ground, I guarantee you, if you do it right, but you're going to break his shoulder if you try to panic and think, this isn't working, and then suddenly force it down. This is gonna come out and it's a lifetime injury. It's never gonna get better. Please don't do that. So these joint locks are meant to work. 
Hey, a couple of other things because there's so much involved here. Once I get him off balance, I like to put his elbow right under my, my sternum under his elbow here so he can't drop his elbow. If I'm in here and he drops his elbow, I'm going to lose my balance and fall down. And then he's going to kick me in the face and high kick. Okay, I'm going to come in here and make sure he cannot drop his elbow. I've got it locked into position. I really don't need this arm, but I'm just using it because this is a beginner's technique. Bend my knees. Shift my hips forward. Sit. See? And that's all it takes to move his hips backwards, called a sokomen. Move his hips backwards and then drop him off the plane of his heels. When I'm standing here, if I keep leaning backwards, I start to rock. And if I can't take a step, I'm going to fall down. And I want his hips back here. And then I'm going to step right into the space where I want him to fall. So all my body weight is in his kazushi point that we talked about before. I'm going to shift him even further and then just let him go. Okay? So I'm really not throwing people. I'm letting them fall down. Okay? Really important that that happens. Out over here. Step in like so. Once you learn these, you can transfer them later to techniques that actually work if you were doing a swipe with a knife. That's a shihonagi. It doesn't look like a shihonagi, but it is a shihonagi. This is a shihonagi. Okay, those work a little bit more combat effective, which looks like a punch, okay? That's two punches. So that's how you would work from a distance if somebody's suddenly running at you. That's how it really looks. But in the beginning, we have to be very meticulous. Step, learn where the connections are, here, 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 and here, and here, and then shift. I'm tightening up my left buttocks muscle. Then I'm gonna let it go. Because the tightening up made him tighten up. And then when I let go, he lets go and he falls down. So this is Shifo Nage. Um, just for the sake of record, this is the nice way to do it. This is the mean way. So if I block here, that's the malevolent way. Practice the benevolent way first. You can do the atimi here or here if you want to, and step in, and later on with care, because that's real easy to put your partner out. Remember, we're all friends. You, we're in the same boat. Don't drill a hole in the other boat. The other, we're the same boat, okay? Don't let the water out in the boat. Don't kill your friends. Do it real slow. Um, in martial arts, there's there's a saying we borrowed a maximum. I don't know where it came from. It's make haste slowly. There are no instant Bruce Lee's. Any of these techniques that Mr. Hooks and I are demonstrating, we practice them in slow motion first. And we can only be fast because we gradually allowed our speed to catch up with our technique. If you try to be faster to show off, you're going to injure your partner. And then you still have to see them. It's going to be uncomfortable. Or you're going to injure yourself. And that's uncomfortable as well. Practice these slowly. Practice these under the direction of a qualified instructor. Okay, we're doing a technique called kaitenage. Uh, kaitenage means windmill throw. Uh, you're doing your uh, paramaki blocks in taekwondo. I'm punching my face. I'm blocking his arm down. I could hit him, but he also could deflect that hit. So I'm going to go from my low block to my sudo. Okay, so from low block, boom. He blocks me, shuto. I'm gonna strike him in the neck, and I'm in my, if he just moves away from me, I'm in my shuto, okay? So, low block, he blocks me, I'm in shuto. All my weight's in my back leg for a reason. So I want these fingers, where I've got my hand right here, cut in to my gut. I want my energy going from the palm, where my radius and ulna bones terminate, across the scapula to his shoulder. This is why it's a shoulder technique. I've captured this shoulder. I'm going across both scapula to the front shoulder, and I'm going to drop his weight straight down where his kazushi point is. This is now just to keep him from standing up like that. Don't put pressure on the head. So I'm going to bend my knees, move forward. I'm holding him up now, and then simply drop. Just simply drop. So basically from here, I just shifted. That's all you need to do, just a little bit. If you're off balance, the slight touch will sit to break your balance. So from here, I'm defending. 
he blocks, he defends himself, I turn. All I've got to do now is shift my weight. And there I am, okay? So I've done a low block, turned into um, a, a pseudo maki, okay? So hot maki, low block, here. I try to hit him, he blocks it. I shift around behind him, I can strike him if I want to, sit, drop him, okay? Now, to accommodate uh, beginners who cannot do the tumble, okay? You can still do this. Since it's a beginner, don't worry about this guy hitting at you. Just turn around behind him and put your hand here and put your hand there across the back, okay? Then simply sit down <laughs> and then let him go, okay? Don't sit down and continue to trap his arms or you're gonna have a broken shoulder and that's not very accommodating, okay? So you're learning to block. This is still something new. Step around behind him, get your position in place over here. Know that your hand is between the scapula and if advanced people would cut it in move forward and then just simply gently gently sit down and say okay i've understood how to get to point a to point b and, and lay him on the floor because no one knows how to tumble at this point as you get more advanced there's techniques that work these can come out of knife attacks or arm bars behind you or even sometimes even in kumite i've seen pulled off in, in freestyle fighting okay but once again kaitanage one of the leads is to get that elbow that hiji back He's gonna to try to block me, so I'm just gonna blend with that. i am secured the elbow. This is close to my body. What's important, if I have this shoulder up, that shoulder down, and the direction from my palm is going this way, so the weight is on his back and shifting forward, and he loses it and falls. He does the pretty tumble because this is art. Uh, in the real life, I would've done like Mr. Hooks and break his shoulder. Okay, Mr. Hooks would take him around, break his shoulder, and set him nicely down to the ground, which I think is really combative and awesome. But uh, we're trying to not get so this next demonstration uh, techniques using movements out of kata. Um, one of Mr. Uh, Grandmaster Melton's um, unique perspectives on this is that these are paired drills. And it's real important that Uke knows in advance what Nagi is going to do because we're doing them over and over and over again. So you never want to surprise anybody. They punch and say, let me show you this one step, and they don't know where to brace themselves or where they're going, and suddenly they have a dislocated shoulder. It's like you do everything slowly at first, Uke is totally prepared, and then he knows where he's going because remember, it's not a fight, it's a drill. So you're not saying, would this really work in a street fight? That's not what this is. This is a teaching moment. The difference between a street fight and a teaching moment. I don't know where I'm going in a street fight. The teaching moment, we're training to get, um, movements that, uh, that we do repeatedly and have um, conditioned responses to, okay? So, let's Okay, now if you were advanced martial arts, you might have recognized a form called chogi right there. Chogi utilizes leg sweeps and takedowns and bullet breaks. There. Here, here, also here, movements like this in, in Chogi. <laughs> you did it. You did the leg sweep, but the beautiful thing I, Mr. Hooks just did uh, is that a lot of the kata we're doing standing up because we can't roll around the floor and do a kata. To the advanced martial artist, some of that's ground fighting. And in, in a confined area like in Chogi, you're in a hallway, sometimes it might go to the floor. And these movements where you're grabbing, punching and breaking sometimes that's a floor technique so you look for this again look for the chogi look for these techniques that are found in chogi you just did it didn't have to be in order lock it there's that there's the leg sweep <laughs> and that's right out of chogi kata and the cool thing about advanced uh, master level martial artists is they just pull elements out of a kata the way we pull words out of the English language. And we put them together. First we're speaking, then we're quoting poetry. This is poetry. Uh, poetry means he's just not going, I'm not gonna follow what instructor said. I am an instructor, and I'm going to use the techniques as I see fit immediately without even having to think about it. And that, that's what Grandmaster Hooks is right now, is he can do that techniques. This is what you want to aspire to, because that's what the end of Taekwondo is supposed to be. Not just following directions, that's what you start with. To become an independent human being. Okay, I can work independently 
and I have taken martial arts into who I am now rather than being a carbon copy of my instructor. Okay? Every instructor aspires to that. Their students should be better than them. Thank you for that. That was really fun to watch. Good. All right, um, let's talk about the anatomy of the neck and lower jaw area and uh, what to focus on when you're doing strikes there to, to the throat. Uh, so um, right in here, next to the here, we have the um, mandible. Up above it is the maxilla. Okay, by the way, on another note, if you're ever punching anybody, don't punch them in the maxilla. I know sometimes we'll say, punch your two knuckles at the philtrum. It's a bad idea because there's teeth there. And if you break those teeth, they're like razors and they will cut your hand. And you've done all this wonderful monkey bar training in your knuckle and it's split in half because there's razors. So I really would avoid hitting anybody here. You'd rather hit those buttons, the knock out here, the knock out there, okay? Just talking about the mandible. It comes all the way around and hinges right up under the skull and here under the mastoid bone, which is right, right below. Uh, there's some muscles in the neck. You've got your sterno, which is, it's the sternum. Sterno, clido, mastoid. Sterno, clido, mastoid muscles. Big, huge muscle in your neck, and flex your neck. You can see it, it's right there, it's huge. It, it helps protect the carotid artery, but it also mainly allows radial motion and lateral motion up and down in the neck. It's responsible for connecting your head to your clavicle. So it's the sterno, it goes right into the sternum, clido-mastoid muscle. It's a very important muscle to know about. Carotid artery runs right inside it. You've got your trachea and larynx right in through here. Larynx strikes, I'm going to strike right there under what you call the Adam's apple if you're doing some kind of a strike. If you hit it hard enough, it will collapse and your uke won't be able to breathe unless you know how to resuscitate them correctly, okay? So don't ever hit anybody there for real unless you're an expert CPR. Okay. Uh, also, learning how to tilt and lift the head right over here so the medulla comes back in this direction and causes a pinch on the uh, 12th vertebra, or 7th vertebra right back here, okay? which affects a knockout. Okay, having said all that, let's talk about some of the strikes. Let's, since you're here, let's just do that one we did before. Uh, in slow motion, if we're suddenly coming in, you score right here to choke me from behind. So he's coming right over here, he suddenly just rushed me and I've got a choke hold. And I'm thinking, I bite his arm, I can do whatever I want to do. But meanwhile, he's bending me over backwards, and I'm about to go into a full naked choke and be choked out. So what I really want to do, I know it sounds kind of stupid, is I want to enter and turn. And in your kind of uh, kata, you have movements called these X stances, where you do this all the time. Come over here and you do these X stances. Those X stances have purposes. They're for rotating our body efficiently in closed quarters. So he's stepping in here and he's turning here. I go into my stance and I strike him right there into the throat. Let's do it from the other direction here so you see the strike. He's coming in here, I think. Yeah. No, oh, that's bad, bad position. <laughs> Over here. Coming in here. There, I can now strike here. Now, when I'm striking, I'm not going to strike like this. He'll see it coming, block me, and then continue his technique. I'm going to come here, inside the arm. So, one more time. This is coming here. When you're fighting, he suddenly turned me around. I'm going to spin right here. I'm lower than he is. I, I dropped. I'm going to come right up in here and strike and then step like so. By stepping, I can affect a throw. If he doesn't know how to fall, 95% of people that fall backwards don't do what Navi did, a break fall. They hit their tailbone and then they hit their head. So there's my, one of my instructors, Anjay Sissi, asked me how many strikes are there in a fight? I went, uh, one, he goes, no, two. You strike him, he strikes the ground. You know, oh yeah, that, that's funny, but it makes sense, okay? So he's coming here, I'm gonna step the turn and then immediately strike him, and strike over here, so he hits his head and hits his tailbone. This is I got my horse stance, which allowed me to go from here to here to help me drop that, uh, affect that fall. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jeremy, come here. Randy? Okay, Jeremy, Randy gonna uh, describe the uh, trajectory of the tiger mouth. The tiger mouth looks like a tiger mouth. There's little fingers, and the mouth is right through here. The striking zone is the ridge. Now, when you get advanced, not only do you strike with the tiger mouth, but you pinch. So you can strike it here, and if you've got adhesion, that means their head didn't get thrown back or you're doing one of these techniques, you can grab the larynx and give it a nice squeeze, which is good for you and bad for them, okay? So here we'll show you there's a size differential. Many people ask, what if they're bigger than me? What if they're taller? What if they're, well, you know, nobody is strong here, and nobody has any shielding here and here. Those are your three primary targets. Secondary targets might be the inside of the knee and so on. 
but we're going to go to one of the primary targets to throw. So if you have taller opponent suddenly crowding the smaller opponent, first thing smaller opponent does is immediately suck out all the air. Whereas so instead of backing away and letting himself be mowed down, he moves in. Good. Now do that again in real slow motion. It was a very good technique. As he comes in, freeze right there. I want you to notice where the hand is. Okay. Also, I would feel free to go ahead and defend and block here to keep him from choking you out. Bring this hand like your forearm is rubbing his belly. And then you strike with the tiger mouth right in through here like this. Okay? So what happens is his eyesight, as he's coming in through here, what back up? He's I am Jeremy, he's a smaller opponent, he's gonna take advantage of it, he's gonna come here and grab him. He never sees this happen. You will see it because you're an observer, but when you're up on it, it's, it's happening to you, all of a sudden you feel it because it comes right up here, which is underneath your lower peripheral. Okay? Your peripheral here, if I'm looking straight ahead, I can barely see the ground. It's a blur, but I can't see anything uh, clearly. If I'm in motion and I'm thinking about your head, my mind goes blank from my stomach down. I'm not thinking about that. Try it sometimes, you're sparring, and see if you're aware of what's going on on the floor. You probably aren't. You're thinking about that person's head, shoulders, stomach, but you're forgetting about the floor completely. So we're going to take advantage of this window of peripheral vision. When an attacker comes in violently, he just comes straight up, just straight up like this. Remember, do not aim your arm back. Do it wrong. Do not aim your arm back like this. He'll see it and block it. Okay, now he's dead. Okay, even if he just comes in like so, he'll see it. He'll see it and block it. So he's coming in here. He wants to literally go right up and just right up his body straight into the throat, and you have an effective combat situation where you end the fight immediately. Remember, combat shouldn't be two or three fights, or it looks like it's, it's, if it's lasting more than three seconds, every second that, tips, that ticks by, your life could end. So you have just one moment to end that fight. If another moment happens, you're at risk, because this isn't sparring where you get new lives like a video game, it's your life. It's on the line. You can snuff out immediately. It's combat. Okay? So, uh, okay. so let's talk about other situations. If Jeremy's just like, he's just punching at me here, here. I'm going to just basically throw his hands over here like this. Okay? So I'm slapping it. I can meet it like this. And I'm just going to cross in Tai Chi. They call it the Wu Chi position. And I'm going to push down, step in, and touch his back. Then I'm going to slide up the arm, strike. And then do this. This looks like single whip in Tai Chi. So coming in here, push, touch the back, strike the throat, lift up the head. This is where we want to get the medulla right here, the back of his head, to come back here and pinch the, the seventh vertebra. Okay? So if he's coming in here, boom, I strike there, he's immediately going to feel that, and I will easily be able to lift this up. Then immediately come down with the chateau or just strike down the tiger mouth again, straight into the throat. You may notice that a lot of these techniques end up with someone lying prone on the floor because I don't want to be going, boom, hit him, and he shakes his head and comes back at me. I don't know what this guy has been through in his life and how much he can take. I do know that once he's on the floor, I have an opportunity to run away, okay? Once he's on the floor, he's going to feel hard ground hit him, and the damage can be severe. It might not, but I have the opportunity to end by, by escaping, okay? So I'm gonna move away from here, step in, touch his back, slide up air, strike the throat. Lift, strike down, okay? This, I don't wanna do fast because I'm touching his throat and lifting up his, his here. But if it's, if it's done fast here, it'd be like about that quick, okay? But I, I have to abort that and not really do it because it'll be devastating. Right? Remember, don't let go. Here, and I let go. <laughs> the minute I have released pressure on his arm, he's free to move that arm. Okay? So I'm touching here, I'm going to ride up that arm. And he forgets about this arm because he feels sensation here. You notice that? That's weird. But once I'm touching your arm, it's like right up. Because you feel that sensation, and your mind is there. If I let go, now his mind can go to his other arm. Okay? Your brain, mind, can only focus on one thing at a time. It can't do two things at once. No matter how much you try, you just can't do it. So here, I'm going to slide up. And that's lift up, boom, push down, and escape. Like so. Okay? Good. What was that last one? Was it? It was just an ox jaw. What? Ox jaw? Straight, straight ox jaw. Okay, from here, ox jaw strike is straight in like so. I like to get into a small stance and drop into here, here, straight up. Ox jaw strike in here. 
He strikes the throat. My knee is behind his knee. As he's falling, I can continue with Chateau. Okay, so it's basically right out of these movements you see in advanced karate uh, kata, your upper don ranking kata, which do this, and also in tai chi, which does this a lot. The way I'm fixing the block is I'm just striking right at him. So he's trying to hit me in the head. I'm just dropping under and then striking straight up and down. Once that lifts up here, I can strike him in the throat. Okay, so it's just striking the, the, the gateway areas in here. Once again, that block is not a cover. And it's not a straight punch. It's a drop here. Uh, kind of call that Age Suki, a rising punch. A rising punch. What I'm doing is a rising ox jaw strike, like this. Here, I mean here, like so. Strike, strike, there. Okay. So those gateways to the throat. Okay, uh, let's talk about the progression of a uh, fight. And by fight, I don't mean uh, kumite or free sparring. Free sparring is not fighting, it's a drill. Uh, one of my teachers called it a drill and failure because I'm failing to put the other guy away. We're just kind of trading punches. Kumite in Japanese doesn't mean fight, it means entangled arms. So we're just entangling our arms and we're doing a drill. Combat means he's trying to harm me or kill me and I have to defend my life. So we're going to be concerned here where self defense has a lot to do with combat situations. The progression of a fight. Go to any YouTube video, it starts off with pugilism. They're punching, they get too close, then they're grappling, and suddenly they're on the floor rolling around. That's just what happens. That's, that's the natural progression of a fight. What we don't want to do is go from point two to point three, from the grappling to the ground. Once it turns into a grappling situation, I want to remain on my feet. He might have buddies, and maybe I'm not as comfortable on the ground. He might be an MMA expert. I don't know. So from here, once this has occurred, and he's trying to come in on me, I'm just going to let go. Okay? This may seem like leaning into a punch. According to, you know, old Okinawan and martial arts philosophies, this is a bad idea. If he grabs my, my jacket, I can use that. Because I now can control his arms. He grabs my jacket, I have control of his arms. If I grab his jacket, he has control of me. He can yank me around. So if I let go, I have control of him. So from here, I'm just going to let go, and I'm going to strike him in the neck. I'll turn around and see if that's And we have these techniques. You might have these techniques. doesn't really, really matter. I'm just going to let go. See my hand that comes to the solar plexus here? That's right here. That's controlling and dropping the shoulder, striking in here like this. I would hit him good and hard and then bounce like this because striking like that is better than pressing. So I would strike him here. So from here, we're going into the situation. He's about to take the tape down. I'm going to hit him right in the neck. Now, after I hit him in the neck, I like to do stances. So I'm going to step right in between his legs and I'm right in my moro te uke or sung su position. Okay? So from here, boom, grab down. This became suddenly a fight, strike, throw them down. Or sometimes better than I wanted to. Okay, so again, you gotta let go. And I just go ahead and do my kata. Here, from here, I can move <laughs> all over the place. I can do whatever I wanna do. You can make things up. Ever see that in Basa? I can do basa. You grab me. I can do mountain punch from basa. Okay, those kinds of things. So anytime someone grabs you here, condition yourself to let go. I can still move his arms. I can do things here, but I don't want to grab his jacket. He has control of my hand now, and I can't use my fingers. But I can let go, and I can do other things. Okay. So another one would be sometimes you do this technique. I think in Japanese karate they do it this way. Grabbing here, I can strike. Like so. so, grabbing me here, I'm literally going to, like I'm praying, and I'm going to rub my arm and strike right here. I'm not striking this way, I'm striking out like a reverse, like an upside down punch, like an uppercut. And I'm striking across the femoral. Look where my knee is, right here. Okay, this is why you have your stances. So, coming here, you grab the hold of me, boom. My knee was behind his knee. So that's basically this position, or in karate, this position here. 
grabs. Like so, okay? One last time, looking at this. So a motion, I'm just gonna let go. See, I can move his arm from here to here. It's real easy. Put my knee behind his knee, strike, bend. Okay? So let's do, those are brachial strikes. I'm using brachial uh, tissue of the arm, striking with my radius, striking with my ulna. Okay? Femoral strikes. Also, I try not to start femoral strikes from here. That's good Muay Thai boxing. And by the way, that works pretty well and it hurts pretty bad, okay? But we're into a self-defense seminar here. So self-defense ends up right in here. This is rarely addressed in self-defense. Self-defense is generally escape my chokehold, escape my head lock, <laughs> escape my full Nelson. But they rarely get into, okay, now we're suddenly we're in a grappling situation and it's dynamic. So we're not holding each other like this. It's, it's moving like so, okay? So I suddenly have to just strike right in through there like that. He's got control of my arms. I did something stupid and forgot to let go with my hands. But you know what? I can move these all I want to. Technique called hikikomi. Bringing my feet together, spreading them out again. But as I spread them out, you may have caught it that do this or this. I'm doing that kata, striking him there, landing in my horse position. Okay? So you want to just say, this is a knee strike. He comes in here, strike the knee, and so Next one is if we're fighting and suddenly he got the upper hand and he's, oh, he's right there and I'm about to lose my neck. Right in here. Striking low, right in the femoral artery. You can go to the groin too if you want to. But um, here, I might miss his groin. But I'm not going to miss this artery because I'm aiming not at his leg but at the floor. Like I'm trying to hit the floor like so. And I'm hitting right across the femoral with this. You hit that hard enough and you do a lot of uh, monkey wire training or heavy bag, bag training, you're going to have a lot of power in your arms. So you're grabbing, boom, strike them down and then get out of the way. Okay, so we've covered um, Morote or Sun Tzu positions, both hitting with one, your Shito or Sudo position, your Hichi or your knee strike into here, and also a low reverse femoral strike with your forearm. Okay? Great. Okay. Uh, in this section, we're going to be talking about uh, tumbling or Ukemiwaza. Uh, uke is the person who receives. Uh, the um, self-defense technique. So ukime is uh, the art of tumbling. Okay, it's important, in my opinion, that if you're going to study something where you're throwing people to the ground or you're being taken to the ground, sometimes forcibly, you need to be comfortable with the ground so you can get back up uninjured. So the art of tumbling, uh, in many schools like jujitsu or judo, is studied more religiously than the throwing itself. And uh, I can always tell uh, what kind of a seasoned martial artist they are by the ukimi that they take. Uh, I can tell what rank or how experienced you are just by how you do a tumble. And that tells me, oh, you've tumbled that much, you're, you, then your uh, wazo, your techniques must be even better. Okay? So we're going to start basically with uh, simple drills which are low impact that anybody can do. We start with our backward tumble, our koho kaiten ukime, or falling backwards. And that means just starts by sitting on the ground here. And his legs are in a figure four position, like so, okay? And he'll make himself into a ball, like just holding his wrists really close to the knees, and simply rock backwards, rock backwards, back and forth, okay? Now when he comes back up again, uh, now, cross your knees the other direction. No, 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 go ahead and just, now, now cross him from, from here. There you go. And then rock back on the other side. So switch. Yeah, we'll tell him. So that way, when you're a beginner, uh, just have them brought back on one side. Then no, don't, don't switch it here. Then come back to landing. Now switch. Now go to the other side. Like that. That's what you teach a raw beginner who's never tumbled before. They just switch feet, and he's going to rock back on one side. Switch feet. Rock back on the other side. Good. Now if you can turn around, uh, face the camera from the rear. Uh, your back to the camera. Good. So we're going to do the exercise one more time. I want you to pay close attention to which side of the back he is uh, rocking back on. So he's got his feet in a figure four and he rocks back. Good. Notice he's rocking back on his right side. So he's coming back off his right hip and all the way up to the right scaphoid. Then when he crosses his legs, uh, well, not, not yet, sorry. 
cross the legs here. Now when he rocks back uh, and his left leg is extended, he's going to rock back on the other side, like so. So you never want to do uh, a gymnastics tumble. In gymnastics, they actually roll down the head and all the way down the spine because you have a nice, soft, bouncy mat. But we don't have that if you're out there on the street on the pavement. Uh, so you don't want to ever put your vertebra or your head in, in the line of impact, okay? Now, turning around, you shall have changed directions in the air. So as we're rocking back, what face this way. As he's rocking back, notice that Navi can now at will, as he's rocking backward to change feet, and he'll switch, uh, basically roll from one scapula to the other while he's rocking back. So as he rocks back, he switches feet, which turns him to the other side. So he rocks back, switches feet, turns to the other side. This is something you want to be doing for, oh, I don't know, a good half hour or more in a classroom. Uh, we practice this for a good two or three hours when we're first uh, learning how to tumble, but we're obsessed. Now, another thing uh, about the hands is you want to keep the, the wrists close to the knees and keep his body like a circle. When he's bending backwards, you don't want to unhinge your hip, or when you're coming forward, you don't want to collapse your body, but keep it, all, not rigid, but firm like a circle. So if I tumble, see how he's keeping his body nice and round like a circle the entire time, and he never unfolds his body and lays out flat. So if he's coming back and does it wrong and he just throws his body back, that kind of stops your tumble and you're disconnected with the earth and you can also hit your head very, very hard. Okay, so one more time, come back this way. Good, switch his feet, comes back again. Good, okay, so he learned to do that. Let's now learn how to roll all the way over. We'll go ahead and turn profile here. And when you're first learning to roll all the way over, uh, we don't want you to come to a standing position just yet. Just go ahead. You start on the ground sitting, and you end up sitting as well. So you're just rolling along the ground and then stopping your motion. So Abby's going to show how he rolls back, comes back up into a kneeling position called Seiza. Okay, go ahead and say And we'll get to the kneeling position. Just Seiza. And then turn around, go the other direction, and just roll back and sit in Seiza. This is a very easy, relaxed way. You don't want to start beginners off by having them dive at the ground. They're going to hit their shoulders, they're going to hit their heads, and you're going to be liable for that because you told them to do that. So never tell a student to do anything that is going to cause them injury. We have to take care of the people that we're training or responsible for them. Okay. Uh, also, bear in mind that learning to do a full tumble, like a standing forward tumble or a standing back tumble, is going to take about six months. There is nobody uh, that's superhuman enough that can do it faster than six months. I don't care who you are, unless you've had prior training that we don't know about. But if you're raw and you've never done this before, it's going to take about six months. Uh, when I first started teaching Navid, Navid is an excellent tumbler right now. I mean, one of the best. How long did it take you to? It took six months. How long did I, I told you it would take how long? You told me it would take six months. And did you believe me? Okay, and that's the truth. Uh, I told him, it'd take you six months, and he said, I think I can do it faster, and you injured yourself. Correct. Yes, correct. He said, I like to use the story, but you know, I've done the same thing. I also was impatient, and I injured myself, and realized, make haste slowly. You know, if you just take your time and do it right, you'll save yourselves injuries, and you actually learn faster if you're patient. And the training lasts longer if you're patient. And don't try to be Bruce Lee in a day, just take six months, and then you can be Bruce Lee forever after that, okay? So, uh, coming back uh, to say so was easy. Now we're going to come back to one knee. So if you turn around and just kick around uh, and just come up on one knee. Now notice, yeah, good deal. Turn around and do that again. Notice on the standing leg, I'm going to stop you halfway through as soon as you stop down, come down. Right about there, notice the position of the ball of his foot hitting the ground, the other foot's in the air. This is good because also, you can use that later on for Kimi uh, Waza or tumbling fighting. Okay, this leg now is going to kick through. It's going to kick through and not hit the ground at all and plant and pull forward like so. Also turn around one more time. I want you to notice the proximity of his head to the ground. As he comes around, notice his head nowhere, I can put my foot under there, is nowhere near the ground. So you don't want to be scraping your ear or hitting your head. Remember, this is where your brain lives, and you don't want impact here because if this goes, the rest of your body goes. This has to be protected above anything else. If you do me a favor, do a very slow motion tumble, okay? So a good exercise when you're learning to tumble and taking that six months is to try to learn where your body is oriented to the ground at all times. 
So whenever you're moving in space in small increments called dots, you should be able to balance yourself momentarily on any one of those dots. Okay? If you're tumbling by throwing yourself to the ground and allowing momentum to carry you forward and then jump to your feet, you're doing it wrong. And you're going to suffer some injury at some point if you keep doing that. Okay? You may get away with it at first, but eventually you're going to be destroyed by it. So take your time and learn this. Okay? And that means just very, very slowly concentrating on where his center is at any given time and balancing his body on the ground. Okay, I remember when I first showed him this, he was in my living room, and uh, he couldn't believe it was possible to do. Now he's doing it better than me. Just come around over here, find your balance points. Know exactly where it is. Be able to do techniques in super slow motion so you know at any given time you are in perfect control over your own tumble and nobody else is. Okay? Good. Uh, one more time. Do a t tumble uh, facing the camera. Right? And then come up in your fighting posture. So when I say face the camera in this direction, do a backward tumble. Come up on one knee. At speed or something? Uh, it's at speed. Good. You notice when he comes up, his hands are in a fighting posture. Also turn foot. Your foot would be turned out at an angle. Okay? Now if his foot were straight, like so, or his hands were down, <laughs> and I threw him, He's open. So you want to come up in a ready fighting posture. You're ready to fight. Uh, if his foot is forward like this, he's walking a tightrope. I can tip him over quite easily, okay? If he turns his foot outward, what happens is your back leg's at an angle and your front leg is also at an angle. So we have kind of a cross formation. He actually has a lot more leverage than if he were standing on a tightrope like this. And he turns his feet like so. This is how tightrope walkers walk. You might notice that they turn their feet outward, okay? So this position, he can readjust his body and not be pulled to the side. And if he had to defend himself by coming up against somebody who was attacking him after he was thrown, he would have a fighting chance in this posture. We actually have an entire curriculum of fighting from kneeling positions. Okay, so um, from that now, just uh, let's go to the uh, one knee tumble. Okay, so he's standing from here doing the backward tumble. Um, we oh, I'm sorry, standing. Standing. Okay, standing backward tumble uh, is you face and you basically turn your foot at an angle like this and sit. So Mavi's going to show how to stand and take a step forward and turn. Right about here, he's going to start rolling off the edge of his foot right here, right up the side of the tibia, femur bone, and the hip, and come around the side, okay? So as he sits, notice he doesn't sit on his, his knee, probably in slow motion as Mavi does, and then come around over to the back and tumble and back up again. Good. One more time. You can't hard too slow. Step, turn, sit, come around, and back up to the knee position. Good. Okay, if you'll do that backwards this time, uh, facing the other direction. Yes. Step, and turn, reaches out with the leg, comes straight up again. Okay, in a nutshell, that's what you want to graduate to in six months from the sitting to the kneeling to the standing. Now let's talk about a simple kaitunukini, or forward tumble, okay? The forward tumble, again, you would start just from a kneeling position in seiza, okay? And um, there's several ways to do this. Probably one of the easiest ways, I guess, is to reach the leg, okay? Uh, once you have this accomplished, I, I hate to say this, there's probably about 50 different derivatives of the forward tumble. All of them are correct, but this is the one we find that teaching beginners is more successful. So as uh, Navi standing and stays in here, he's going to be one to tumble out that direction. So the first thing he does is reach for the ground. Good. Now he's going to reach for his knee, like so, cross under, and kick his knee back, like this. And what he's doing is his hand is chasing his leg, and he's going to tuck his, his head under. Now for right now, he's using this hand for support. Eventually we won't do that anymore. Okay, as he continues to tumble, he's going to tuck, balance on his scapula, come around to the other side, and then pull with the front foot, pulls the hips over the leg like so. Okay, if you go back and sit back down again, this is an exercise you want to practice to get your soleus really, really strong. You just sit like this and just pull yourself up. And then sit back down and pull yourself up. 
you know, you'll feel that after a while, and you'll get up and go, I'm very warm and sore right in this area. But after that, I bet your sidekicks will be really powerful because you're going to have really, really powerful growing muscles, okay? But also, when you're, you're coming back up again, you don't have to suddenly try to throw yourself forward. You can do it like, yeah, like that. <laughs> you can just sit up. Sit up, and he's like he's being pulled up from the top of his head, okay? So this is a good exercise when you're doing drills. Hey, let's just try that exercise. And it strengthens up your legs and your back and your posture a lot better. Posture in ukeme is 100% uh, very, very, very important. Uh, you can't be doing ukeme and come up in a slouch position. You want to be coming up as though you're being pulled from the top of your head. If you want more forward tumble, and go ahead and go to a standing position. So forward tumble to a standing position is just to show you what posture is all about. To stand, and stand up in the air? Yeah, stand up in the air. Just going to roll and then stand up. You notice that that line of direction went straight up here. So when he didn't stand, what he, what he didn't do was get up and hunch his back and stand up in an ungainly fashion. But literally, as though he's being lifted. One more time. As though he's being lifted from the top of his skull. Okay? Here. Posture's there. As he comes up, it's as though there's an energy pulling you up from the ground. Okay? That's how you want to come to a standing position. Okay? So let's do that one more time. Just from the kneeling position, then we'll work about going from, from a, a, a one knee and then a standing position. So from kneeling, you just reach, turn, and come up. Okay, now just for grins, I want to show you a derivative of that. This might be for the advantage. Who's the one that uh, shows this? Okay, um, this is a derivative. Once you get really good at that, uh, Navi does this one, and I think it's a superior way to tumble. Uh, go ahead and show that one right here. Reaches out with his hand, and that gives him more of a um, a turn out position. Do it again one more time. When you're tumbling, uh, at first you might be going straight over like this. Okay. The more straightforward you are, the more at risk of damage you're going to be. It's a good idea to turn out more sideways. That also gives you more clearance for your head. So when you're tumbling out sideways, you can come straight up again, and you're not going to be hitting your head on the ground or hitting your spine on the ground. So as you're coming forward, he's Wiping the ground out there, and he's clearing. You want to clear that head, and then just not even hit it, and then just come forward and pull. Good. Okay. From there, you want to graduate to from. I'm just going to kneel and tumble. Okay. Again, you don't want to stand just yet because if you've never tumbled before, going from here to there, that's quite a distance, and it's a little scary at first. You feel like you're right there, and there's my tipping point. Now I'm falling. And if you're not confident with it, you're going to fall on your shoulder and hurt yourself, okay? So if you're halfway position, so I'm one, making a ball. See how he makes a ball with his hands like this. He comes in over here and just rolls like a ball around here like so. Good. Now you do it one more time. You notice how he leaned forward just a little bit and committed himself to the tongue. Right about here, bent his knee. Then here, there's a bit of a liftoff where he has to kind of push up a little bit with his back leg just to get his body up and around, and then you just take off. Good. And again, the main thing, don't hit your head on the ground, okay? And instructors, it's a good idea if I'm instructing Navi and I say, now go ahead and put your hands out here, is to watch their head. Look how close I am to him. As he tumbles, I'm literally like that. I put my hand right under his head. That's a safeguard because no, no one's going to be able to do this right the first time. And if you don't protect your students, they're going to say, how come you let me do that and now I've got a, a twisted neck? Hitting your head on the mat isn't going to cause your cranium any damage. It's going to damage your neck. Okay? So you're going in there and you hit your head and you turn your neck. You're going to get, well, there's something wrong and you have a chiropractor bill or, or worse. Okay? So he's coming through here one more time. If I were the instructor, he were the student. He's coming in here. I'm going to spot him like a gymnastics coach. And as he comes up here, I put my hand right under his head, and I help him on up. And that helps him to fall better and protects his skull. Please do that. Don't just let people fall and say, walk it off. Walking it off is not a cure. Okay, as a matter of fact, it's worse. If someone's hurt their neck, sit down and get help. Don't say, go walk it off. Please don't do that. Okay? Uh, you're gonna, you might, they might end up owning your school. Okay, so from one knee position, that's tumbling. Now from standing position. Standing position is the scariest transition. You've gone from one knee, which is pretty easy. You're pretty low to the ground. Now you're standing. Okay, so from standing, go ahead and go to the first part. Steps forward. 
And again, for safety, he uses both of his, his arms, okay? And he's going to lean in until his hands touch the ground. Same thing here. Commit to the exercise and then kick. Good. Again, if you've never done this before, what does the coach do? Protect the head. As he comes in through here, I'm watching him. I'm going with him. And protecting his head like that, okay? After I feel like he can do it, I don't feel any pressure on my hand anymore. Like I'm going to put my hand under his skull and his head never touched my hand. Now you're solo. I feel like you can do it, okay? But I'm going to be sure if my hand is under his head and I still feel skull on the palm of my hand, he's not ready for me to get that hand away now, okay? So as he's tumbling, I'm happy he can do it. So I'm going to go ahead and spot him one time. Come up under here, and I didn't feel anything but air under my hand. I felt like, you know what, he's good. He's a great tumbler, so you're on your own now. Don't hit your head on the floor, okay? But it does give them the sense of the fact that since I'm protecting your head, that's something you don't want to ever hit on the ground, and you're aware of it. Many students, when they try to tumble, I've watched a lot of classes tumble, don't have that awareness. And they'll just say, I just want to tumble, and they're never thinking about their head hitting the ground. And I see a lot, a lot of heads scraping the mat. And if they got thrown out there on the sidewalk, that's concrete, and it's bumpy concrete scraping you in the head, or a broken bottle hitting you in the skull. Always remember that. This is just a nice training safe area, but out there it's not. You don't know what kind of surface you're going to be tumbling on. So be sure you can tumble well on that. So that's from a sitting position, rolling backwards, into a standing position. Now very, very quickly, before we move on to more advanced falls, Let's, uh, the next falls after that are just basically like diving tumbles and walking tumbles as well. And there's also break falls. Can you just demonstrate just to jump up and do a break fall? Good. Never tell anybody to do that right off the bat because that's going to be bad. That took him years of study. Now, some people will want to be teaching the break fall. Let me give you an exercise that a great Olympic judo coach taught us. Okay. And that is basically how to do a break fall safely. Now he's on all fours, he hands me his hand. Now, at no time am I ever going to pull on Navid's arm. I'm simply just going to hold it there, and he does the rest. Go. Good. No time did I pull up on his arm. I was teaching this to a class once, and I said the same thing. And I drilled with my uke, it was Thomas Merhau. And we I drilled with him and drilled with him, and the first thing someone did was what? Pulled up on the arm. He pulled up the arm, and his, his uke had a dislocated shoulder. Okay, so one more time to do this exercise. This is a good, safe way. She's going to hand out the hand. I'll stand side. I don't want to stand here. He'll hit me in the groin. I'll stand right over here, give him clearance, and he just takes off. Turns, slaps the ground. There's a lot more instruction, if we have time to give another take a second, to talk about the angle in which your hand is hitting. I'll just briefly cover it right now. If you're doing a break fall, uh, so just lay on your back and just show the angle again. Good. The angle of the hand is about a 45 degree angle down here, and then immediately it comes right back up and it shields your face. So if I did, let me do a throw. If I just did a throw on that, yeah, I might want to stomp his head. You see where his, head, his hand went immediately? He didn't just leave it out there uh, to break your skull. I might still hurt him, but he can do something like this to me. If you study your jiu-jitsu, you're a good jiu-jitsu cop over here, and I go to hit his head, he's going to sweep my leg and not let me do that, okay? So it's not just blocking. There's techniques that you can handle yourself so if you need to get from. Okay, we left off. Uh, we did the forward uh, tumble and the standing back tumble. Uh, one thing that needs to be addressed is the line of tumble that you're never tumbling straight down your back, nor are you tumbling straight down one side, but it's at an angle from the hip to the, to the back of the shoulder over to here. You're just tumbling across your back like so. Later on, especially if you're doing gumdo, and I don't know if gumdo has any tumbling with swords, we, we, we do it. If you don't tumble across here, <laughs> you're gonna cut yourself on the way around. So also, if you don't tumble across here to get thrown down, you can be coughing up blood. So Navi's gonna show kind of a, a really awesome drill we learned from somebody else about how to have we call it loud feedback. You tumble, you stand up, and there's visual evidence of whether or not your tumble was perfect. We take a piece of tape, and you can use just painter's tape, blue painter's tape or whatever, and just put it on the floor, and then orient yourself to the tape, and then roll right on it and see what happens. 
Good, then when you turn around, it'll tell you whether or not you rolled correctly, okay? So basically, what we didn't want to see is this. That would be bad. This is kind of correct. And it shows that the trajectory, he's going right down his arm, going onto the shoulder muscle, coming around that big plate called the scapula, and right across here over the hip. Had the tape been up here somewhere, he would have been hitting his head and his shoulder. Okay, so since you see the trajectory to kind of make this nice little hook and then come across over here, that would be called a perfect tumble. That's, that's what you want to be seeing when you come up over, uh, around there, okay? So what he did was he purposely put his shoulder right on that tape and then rolled around over here. So don't be dismayed if you don't see his perfect line and should hook at the end, showing that you did use your arm, okay? Next thing we need to know about is how to receive ukime, okay? Um, if we're doing techniques, if it's judo, I would be called the tori, he'd be the, the uh, uke. Uh, if we're doing uh, jujitsu, it'd be uke nage, okay? Uke is the receiver. He's receiving the waza or the technique, and I would be nage. Nage means to throw, the person who throws, okay? I'm just going to do, I'm not even going to do a real technique, I'm just going to pretend I'm doing a really terrible kodagashi here, and let's turn this way so you can see your ukime. Okay, if I were to throw uh, navi in, in a horrible kodagashi, rather than squatting down and trying to resist the fall and falling on his butt. He's going to go ahead, once he feels like that's about to happen and he's committed to the fall and there's no way out, he's going to empty his leg by moving it straight forward like so. Good. Now let's do that again one more time. Did you see the figure four that occurred in his feet just like we did before when he was doing the seated tumbles? As I was taking him down, he made that figure four and landed like so, okay? Uh, and show a little bridge you do as well. Yeah, he likes, you know, we bridge up. So coming down right here, he bridges up here. This is a good way, I've got a foot under his body here, rather than as soon as he lands, he just lays down and lets his body just cushion the floor. We like to bridge up. One of the reasons is I may decide to jump on him after I threw him down, or I might throw him down and suddenly go into a submission hold. And if his body's touching the ground here, I can do that. But if he's got air, he can shrimp a lot easier. He can move around on the, on the ground, stick his, run, his, run into me here, trap my legs, rather than receiving a submission. Okay? So one more time, once he feels like he's, he's at a loss, he's going to do it, just kick out like that. Good. Remember, these are beginning techniques. These are not advanced techniques. Advanced techniques, you're going to do a lot of aerial break falls. That's another tape another time. Let me show him that little squat thing you did before. So, if you're falling down, try to get knees to bend, butt to go back, display out. Reach your heels and palms out. So, if I'm getting shoved, I'm not slamming my elbows into the ground, I'm not catching myself with my wrist. So if I get hit, so like, boom, and I do this, that's a recipe for breaking my radius. As I was talking about earlier. So, same thing again. Cool. I clear distance, my feet are up to do something. Yeah. I didn't want to be here, but I split out. So, bend down, that's it, reach out. Good. And these are exercises you could also do by yourself. Or show that one where you're just standing, you kick your leg out and reach out with one. You see how he did here, and that you talked about, uh, and Mr. Melton was telling us earlier today that there's a lot of accidents where people just reach for the ground. I've seen some, I don't know if Mr. Melton's seen them, where you're falling and in a panic moment, you try to brace yourself with your arm and your radius bone pops right there. That's a common martial art injury. It's a common injury falling off your bicycle or tripping off a banana peel and you, you fall down. This is a great memory exercise where you, if you do it enough times, your body will remember to trust, trust itself to do this more smoothly. So you just kick your leg and then just roll, just like so. Now the worst you can get is you know, some skin abrasions on the palm of your hand, okay, when you do it that way. Oh, that skin abrasions on the palm of my hand heal faster than a broken bone, okay? Also a broken rib if you fall on your side, okay? So those are some good ways of taking ukime. Other ways of taking ukime is if the forward tumble in the form of the kaitanage. If I'm doing kaitanage here, if I aim him in the right direction, he's now lined up to do his forward tumble. Okay, and he can just tumble right out of it. This allows us to practice safely. 
if some wild, crazy person were attacking me and I end up having to do Kaitanage, it's not going to end up with him tumbling. I'm going to try to break his arm or his neck or something like that, something more serious. He's not going to do this beautiful tumble. Tumbling is an art. What it does is it allows us as martial artists to escape the uh, the the waza or the uh, the joint hold that, that we've received. We can escape and clear and get distance between us and our attacker. It also allows us to be able to practice together routinely. Okay, and the tumbling is just something I, I've taught. You know, if someone throws me, I can hit the ground and get back up again and not get hurt. Okay, but it doesn't mean that every time we do something in a self-defense situation. I'm expecting this guy to do this beautiful tumble out there. He's never done one before. Usually it's going to be snap, crackle, pop. And that's what's going to happen. So genuine self-defense is kind of ugly. In the dojo, it's art. So remember, that's dojo technique, is we practice so that we can continue to have these exercises that condition our responses. But when it happens out there, it's just really, really ugly and doesn't sound very pretty either. Okay? So don't think, well, that will never make me fall. No, it's not meant to. It's meant to break your arm. Okay, a lot of the submission holds, we take a person to the floor, we make them tap out. Well, in reality, I'd be breaking the shoulder and I wouldn't go down the floor with them at all. Okay, so remember, ukeme is for the dojo. And also, just in case you get thrown by a judo expert or a MMA guy, at least you'll know how to hit the ground and not get hurt. All right? Okay, let's talk about uh, some more kind of fighting in the modern day. I, I hate to use the word modern day because I think everything is cyclical. Um, when I first started martial arts uh, in the 70s, and uh, Mr. Melton started in the 60s, uh, fighting was different in America than it is today. It's quite different. Um, starts off in America as a lot of wrestling, a lot of boxing. In Teddy Roosevelt's time, judo got introduced, but it wasn't real widespread. Then we had a TV show called Kung Fu, and suddenly everybody's doing Kung Fu, and they're kicking to the head. And Taekwondo and Karate came in, and again, they're kicking and punching. And then one day, we had this thing called World uh, uh, Ultimate Fighting Championships. And they had a lot of stand-up fighters, and one Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert was grabbing people by the legs and throwing them down and winning the matches. And now it's MMA. So MMA started in ancient Greece and Babylonia, and the, the Persians had it and mastered it thousands of years ago, and now we're right back to it again. So since that's what's on everybody's mind right now, a lot of times we're in here, we're fighting, and all of a sudden he's wanting my legs, and he's going to throw my legs, he's going to throw me up in the air, okay? So a lot of times when it comes to grappling situations, he's going to check my hip. This is common in MMA series, he's going to check the hip to knock my hips back, and then grab my feet and just throw me up into the ground and my head hits the floor. If I allow that to happen, or if I tense up my body, he gets to finish his technique. Here's what I want to talk to you about, and it's rarely, almost never addressed in martial arts, is why in the world we have these ridiculous long stances. And there's a big debate about these ridiculous long stances. Why do you have these? Why do you have these? Why do you have these? Okay, I'm thoroughly convinced that when people in, in, in China, Okinawa, had to defend themselves against grapplers, these long stances were methods to control their arms. Okay, to control the arms. Because right in here, he's checking me, and his arms are here. Now, if I do Goju Karate, and I do San Chin, I can knock him down from there. But I might not get that lucky. Okay, so I'm coming in here, I can immediately step low into a horse position and turn. What I've done is officially done what's called a hijitoshi. Hijitoshi means I've taken his elbow and I've moved it outside his balance point and I dropped it down. Okay, well if we're up here with my arms, I could do that, but now we're at my legs. So there's his elbow and he's grabbing my legs. So I'm just going to go ahead and bend my knees, put all my weight on one leg and step out and drop his elbow here. Okay, then I can put my knee on it. We can do techniques to empty where we go down to one knee and do this. Okay, so he's grabbing me in here, step out over here, strike, and uh, crush his ribcage. Notice I never want to go to the ground with anybody. If I'm forced to go to the ground, that's when my judo takes over, that's when I do my jujitsu. Jiu-jitsu is a last-ditch effort when it's ground fighting. It should not be your go-to exercise. Right now, it seems to be people's go-to exercise because they watch a lot of MMA and they go take jiu-jitsu lessons. They pick up those feet, okay? So he's coming in here and he's grabbing here. There's so many things you can do, but the one we're going to be learning right now is simple. You step and you spread his arms out like this, drop. And from there, you can drop your knee, you can drop your knee, and come in here and do some strikes on the way back down. 
Don't think that you're limited to just your feet. It's striking. There's a technique if you do um, this technique in Tekken or Chogi, where you're here. Same thing happens. He goes for my legs. I step out. I strike. I strike. That's right out of Tekken. Where they step across here, they're here, and do that technique in there. That's a hallway. And we're in a hallway, and he's hitting me here. And I'm going to step behind him and grab and strike him like that. We don't have much room to fight. Okay? Now, knowing that technique, there's other things you can possibly do. If he strikes me in here, what I'm aiming for, he's turn this way, is I'm looking for hips and an open area right there. This is why I like the front stance. The front stance teaches you to do this and this. So he's coming at me really fast. If I simply step, he'll lose his balance. You, if you do it correctly, he, he can't hold his balance. Stick to here, like so. Do it super slow motion. I'll show you the mistakes that people make. Picking my leg up. I'm going to get thrown backwards. Trying to use the wrong leg. I'm going to get thrown sideways, okay? What I want to be doing is reaching and not plump, plodding my foot down. So I'm reaching under here. And as soon as I feel him hit my stomach, freeze right there. Too late. <laughs> it, it worked too well. Right about here, freeze. I would have already had my foot there. As he's coming in, I'm coming in, and I've planted my foot. He has touched me here. My hands are here. I can strike if I want to, but my hands are here. I'm going to aim with my stomach like a spear into the ground. Okay? Just like so. Okay. Keep going. Okay. So, knowing those techniques, Jeremy, what we do in classes is we do this as a randori exercise. Go ahead and bow and randori. Just take turns grabbing each other. We just do this as a randori exercise. Good. To where somebody's trying to grab your feet actively, and you're immediately not letting them take you to the floor. They just do this over and over and over again. And it's semi-compliant because we're trying to teach each other how to do it. When you get very good at it, it's not compliant anymore, and you take off all the safety parameters and say, okay, I'm not going to fall no matter what you do, and I'm going to grab your legs no matter how hard you try not to let me, and then we see if it really works. But in the beginning, this is just called randori. Go to your team. It's just called randori. Randori is just a drill that you do back and forth, and you work creatively using the principles. Creative doesn't mean make stuff up. It means use the principles that we've taught and then be fluid with them. To see if you have some good follow-up techniques. We try a couple more follow-up techniques. You know, follow-up technique would be like kick him on the floor or strike him on the way down. Good. Follow-up techniques. He takes it to the ground, he hits it. Follow-up techniques. Good. Okay, yummy. Good. So this is good. Uh, there's all kinds of ways just to demonstrate a couple. Um, Oso Fogari. Okay, uh, you get a good judo expert. Now, good. Judo expert might take me to the floor in a heartbeat because it's so fast. But if I'm drilling this, Oso Fogari is an inside, you know, major inside reap. He's going to come in here and he's going to kick my leg out. So the minute he kicks his leg forward, <laughs> I do Tai Chi. <laughs> I just push down. Like so. So anytime someone's doing judo, we're playing judo, we're moving around right here. When I see someone pick his leg up, I'm going to apply pressure into that hole. And I don't have to do a fancy throw, okay? If he's doing um, koshinagi slowly. Koshinagi. There I go. I'm about to get killed. Because he's doing koshinagi. If I relax, it doesn't happen. And I do that very nicely. Because he gets in here, he's going koshinagi, hip throw. I'm just going to sit and walk backwards, okay? Because this, he wants me to go that way. He's pushed in here. Here I'm going to go. If I lean into it, I'm down. However, if I step backwards, <laughs> I can do my karate. And I don't have to play judo. If I have to go against a judo Olympian, he's going to wipe the mat with me because he's more comfortable in his art. Play your own game. Somebody comes up and wants to kickbox, you can touch him, Okay, do your taekwondo. You go to class and you learn kata. And if you don't do your kata and you're fighting, then why are you studying kata? Might as well just go take a kickboxing class. 
Study your kata. Your kata teach you things. We did everything we did today were straight out of kata. Okay? Your kata teach you to fight. That doesn't mean you fight like a choreographed exercise, but you take pieces of body mechanics you learned in your kata and you put them together like you put words together in language. Okay? So just try to keep that in mind when you're studying your kata. That's just as important, if not more, than your fighting.